I am beating every N64 game, and I mean all of them. The twist is, the next game I play is randomly selected, so I have no clue what's coming next. This is the journey to beating every N64 game. Game number 89, Super Robot Wars 64. Released exclusively in Japan in 1999, this game was developed and published by Bon Presto. This is quite an interesting one. Turns out this game is a turn-based strategy game, and it's the first one we've played on the N64. My only experience with this genre is Final Fantasy Tactics on the PlayStation. Surprisingly, the Super Robot Wars, or Super Robo as it's known in Japan, this series is quite popular with games still being released to this day. Essentially, this game is something that just seems like it should not exist, other than some unlicensed fan game. But it's very real and it's very officially licensed. It's a mashup of so many different mecha anime series, cramming them all into the same universe. Wikipedia lists 25 different animes that this game takes characters from. The main ones you might recognize are Gundam Wing or G Gundam. When I started this series and decided to include the Japanese titles, this one may have made me reconsider it had I known it existed. Maybe you can already tell why by the length of this video. Anyway, let's jump into it. Before actually starting the game, I noticed an amazing thing that this game offers. Karaoke mode! I decided to give singing along to the Gundam Wing theme a shot, and yeah, I'd say I killed it. I'll let you be the judge though. Communication Japanese text, Japanese text, Japanese text tonight. Come on, you know you liked it. Anyway, the game has a single player story mode, so that's what we'll be doing to beat this game. It opens with a massive lore dump. As you might be able to tell, the text is all in Japanese. Despite the series being popular, this one does not have a fan English translation patch. There's quite a lot of text, so I imagine it'd be a huge undertaking. The gist of this opening is that Earth is overpopulated, so people began living in space colonies to combat it. 80% of the human population was in space, but the world government remained on Earth. Despite this, they had say over what both the space people and the Earth people had to do. One of the space colonies declared war on the Earth government, and this caused half the human population to die within six months. When the war ended, it was only the beginning of humanity's troubles. Aliens from the Muse Zorbatos Empire invaded and set 70% of the cities on Earth on fire. They were still suffering from the war, so the humans had no choice but to surrender. Now the entire Earth sphere was under control of the Muse Zorbatos Empire, and they were very oppressive rulers. Humans thought this was the end, but lately, resistance forces have started popping up. Next, you choose your character. Bon Presto created four original characters to serve as the protagonist for this game. On the left is our character, and on the right is their rival. I'm not sure who all the rivals are, but the four characters are Arc Light Blue, Selene Menez, Brad Skywind, and Manami Hamil. I went with Selene because I thought her hair looked cool. Her rival ended up being this dude named Rich. Then it gives a bit of background lore on Selene. She's a resistance fighter who joined to avenge the death of her father who died during the Muse Zorbatos invasion. She had risen the ranks and was seen as a top fighter in her field. It felt hopeless though as her comrades kept dying. But then something happened that would change her destiny. And then it jumps into the first mission. Typically a mission begins with characters having dialogue like this. There's so much storyline in this game. Thankfully, we found this site called Akurasu where someone transcribed the text and translated it to English. This was a godsend for this game. I've linked it in the video description. Anyway, in this first dialogue, Selene is talking with this dude named Hamilton. They've discovered an Imperial prototype robot that's been abandoned, but it looks like it can be repaired. Hamilton thinks they should steal it, but Selene knows they'll send people to retrieve it in order to keep their military secrets. Still, Hamilton just can't resist. Then it goes into the actual mission itself. The graphics during a mission are quite surprising. It genuinely looks like a game you'd see on the Super Nintendo. There's a bit more dialogue where all of Selene's troops, including Hamilton, are killed by the Empire. Selene gets her ship destroyed and jumps into the prototype mentioned earlier. And then finally we get actual gameplay. So as previously mentioned, this is a turn-based strategy game. You have a bunch of troops and they're usually colored blue and you command them to do something one by one. 
At the start of the battle, all I can do is move Selene, since she's my only troop. Likewise, the enemy has their own army of troops, which are usually red. Once you've ended your turn, they'll do something with all of their troops. The enemy decided to attack, which brought up the battle screen. This will appear hundreds, if not thousands of times during a playthrough of this game, and it's very important to understand it. The attacker is on the left and the defender is on the right. Both sides have the same info just for each respective mecha, so mine is on the right. At the top it shows a meter for my health and my energy, which is for using abilities during battle. The text with the number 1 on the right is my level, and the first three lines of text just say my name and the type of robot I'm using. The fourth line is a second type of energy, and the bottom is a hit chance. So the enemy has a 29% chance to hit me in this encounter, and I have 100%. You can choose to either counterattack, dodge, or defend. Counterattacking will run the battle with the current odds, and you'll attack after they attack you. Dodge will make their chance of hitting you less, but you won't counterattack, and defend keeps the odds the same, but you take much less damage, and you don't counterattack. When an attack happens, it shows an animation for each attacker depending on what move they use. These, eh, they're decent I'd say. On this move, Selene dodged and the other guy got wrecked and died in one hit. I know all this now, but during the actual playthrough, I had no freaking idea what was going on at this point. I was just kind of winging it. Luckily, Selene is super OP in this first mission and she keeps dodging and one-shotting all the other guys. After a few turns, our rival Rich shows up and he's the head of the force retrieving the robot Selene's piloting. He's wondering why it's moving around and realizes somebody must be inside. When he learns it's a woman, he gets real excited. <laughs> You'll uh, come to learn Rich is pretty much a creep. Then on the next turn, some guy named Quattro shows up along with Apolly and Roberto. I believe Quattro is from the original Gundam anime, but not too sure. They realize we're also part of the resistance and offer to help us. Rich realizes this will be tougher than he thought, but he continues anyway. Quattro is a good ally to have, as his attacks pack quite the punch. Not to mention, they only had a 1% chance of hitting him. I'd killed all the regular troops, and only Rich was left. I literally hadn't gotten hit by this point, but yeah, Roberto got one shot by him. Generally, you can lose any troops you want, as long as you keep certain key characters alive. In this mission, the only one who needs to survive is Selene. And, uh, yeah, I kind of let that happen, and, uh, I got game over on mission one. <laughs> Rip. Next time around, I had Quattro blast Rich instead. He takes a fixed amount of damage and decides to run away. So this game doesn't have permadeath like something like Fire Emblem does. Instead, you earn a certain amount of money for killing enemies during battle. If your non-key troops die, you revive them after the mission by giving up some of your earnings. So here, Roberto costs 2,000 to repair. There's a bit of lore after the mission usually too. Essentially, Quattro and Selene decide to join forces to fight the Empire because why not? Plus, Selene is awesome. Between missions, you can save your game along with improving the mecha in your squad. You're able to spend the money you earn to increase their HP, energy, mobility, armor, and honestly, I'm not sure what the last one does. There's also a different screen where you can increase the damage of their different attacks. There's a few other things you can do on this screen, like move people around to different mechs, but well, with the language barrier, we never really figured out how it worked. I think it'd make the game a lot easier if you mastered it. So now it's on to mission two. Quattro takes Selene to meet the rest of the team. He introduces her to Captain Bright, the leader of the Earth Liberation Front. He's all like, oh my god, Selene, I've heard you're an amazing fighter. Please kick those aliens' butts for us. And she's like, no, I can't perform miracles. Before they know it, some new guy shows up and no one knows who it is. They're like, hey, who the heck are you? And he's like, my name is AG, and y'all are screwed. The Empire's coming to this location right now. They don't really believe him, so they put him in handcuffs. But then I guess they decide he's a good guy and they do believe him. It turns out AG and Captain Bright fought together when the Muse Orbatus Empire first invaded. Before they can have a good old fashioned reunion, they're interrupted by aliens attacking. Guess Eiji was too slow. When I got into the mission itself, I now had a couple new troops to work with, being Eiji and Captain Bright. Eiji has much higher movement than other troops. It's partly because his ship is flying, but also people have different stats as well. His attacks pack quite a bunch too. He has this missile attack that just blasts people in one shot. Captain Bright's ship is just trash for combat. It can barely move, but it's really tanky. I didn't learn until later in the playthrough, but you can put people inside Bright's ship to recharge their ammo and energy. 
If Bright dies in any mission, it's game over. Speaking of attacks, attacks have many different properties to them. Obviously, they have an amount of damage associated with them, but they also have a range. So here, Apali has his first three attacks in red. They can't be used because they're out of range. In contrast to that, the bottom attacks can usually only be used if you haven't moved on that turn. It's like a game balance thing, where if you move closer, you can't do your most powerful attacks. There's also some kind of effectiveness with a letter ranking, but I never really understood it. I think it might have to do with the terrain you're in. After killing most of the bad guys, a bunch of new ships appear. One of them's an Imperial general named Gale. Apparently Eiji was in his army, but obviously now he's defected to us. Gale's totally not cool with that. Carla's here with Gale and she's even more upset. Just keeps screaming. I guess we'll kill him. It turns out these guys can back up their trash talk. All the basic troops were usually killed easily and they never really hit me. Selene was dominating, but her attack missed Carla. And instead of missing, Carla nailed me with a laser for solid damage. Then later, she freaking killed Quattro. Selene pulled through though and killed Gale. AG was sad, but I guess he didn't actually die because he was still talking. After the mission, we're introduced to General Blex, the leader of the Earth Liberation Front. He thinks we've got a weird team going, but looks like we're making it work. Then he says he'll get us some reinforcements from New York. And later, we learn that Gale is Eiji's older sister's fiance. That's why he was so upset fighting against him. But like, we're rebelling, so can you just get over it, Eiji? Well, now it's on to mission three. How many missions are there in total? Well, we'll just say there's a lot. Keep in mind, I always spent money on upgrades between missions, but I usually just spammed it all on Selene. This mission brings in even more new characters. We've got Anna and David. They're visiting a city that's completely under Imperial control. They want to resist against them, but they're all alone. I guess they get caught by Imperial soldiers, and one of them is this dude named Rowan. He used to be their friend, but now he's pledged allegiance to the Muse Zorbatos Empire, saying they're awesome. Just before they're taken prisoner, some girl named Rose shows up, causing a huge commotion, giving them enough time to get away. The three of them run to safety. After that, Selene is raising some concerns with Bright and Quattro. She's like, oh my god, this is hopeless. We'll never be strong enough to take down the Empire. And they're like, wow, way to be a buzzkill. Plus, we've got new weapons in development. Selene also mentions something called the Romefeller Foundation, which supposedly is Terrans having some form of government allowed, even under Imperial rule. I believe a Terran is someone who lived on Earth itself, rather than one of the space colonies, but that might be wrong. Then we meet yet another new character, some guy named Shiro. He's in his own guerrilla unit trying to rebel against the Empire. However, they're way out of their league and get ambushed. Then the mission starts. This one starts off with like a cutscene, essentially. Shiro and his friends are getting attacked and all Shiro's friends die. Then he goes and kills all the minions. The only ship left is a big one and apparently it's piloted by this girl named Aina. It seems like Shiro and her have some history. She's telling Shiro to stay away, but I made him attack anyway. I should have listened because I got absolutely obliterated. Game over again. I just kept dying here, and it felt like there was no way I could kill her. It turns out I had to get next to her ship. This would give me a new command to talk to her. I'm not exactly sure what Shiro said, but she ran away. After that, David and Ro and the gang all showed up in the corner, but trailing behind them is one of the warlords of the Muse Empire, Gostero. He kills all of them except David and Ro. Just when you think they're done for, Selene and the gang all show up just in time to save them. Gostero then brings in the rest of his crew and we got a battle on our hands. Also, Shiro is randomly watching everything happen down in the corner. I think his ship overheated or something. A couple turns into the battle, we learn that David and Anna both know Eiji from the past, but it doesn't really elaborate further. Although Anna seems real attached to Eiji. Right away, I noticed Ro barely did any damage and she died kinda quick. I thought she sucked, but she would come to be one of my top party members later on. I was kicking Gostero's minions' butts when a stunning turn of events happened. Gale and the gang showed up in this mission too. He says he's there to save Gostero because he's getting his butt kicked by a bunch of noobs. But uh, didn't we beat you last battle, Gale? The battle was heating up when I made contact with Gostero himself. I was freaking out thinking he was going to annihilate me. He charged up and rammed right into Quattro, dealing a whopping 400 damage. Uh, wow, this guy sucks. The battle whittled down to just Gale and Carla left. I parked AG directly next to Gale and he had a new attack available called V-Max. 
I used it and it played this big animation showing him powering up and then ramming Gale over and over. Killed him in one shot, oh my god. After Selene blasted Carla to oblivion, the mission was over. After the battle, David, Anna, and Aegy are having a good old reunion catching up. But Selene is a buzzkill and is all like, hey, shut up, we gotta get moving. Then Shiro lets off a distress flare, so Quattro and the gang investigate. Shiro is like, uh, my mech is busted, please save me. So we decide to let him tag along, even though he's useless. After that, we learn that Ro and David were in a battle against the Empire on Mars three years ago. AG rescued them. And apparently Anna's in love with him. So now it's on to mission four, and the gang is talking about something called Operation M. I guess someone's dropping weapons to Earth and disguising them as meteors. Seems like meteors would cause damage on their own, but whatever. Then we get introduced to someone named Lieutenant Zex. I think he's from Gundam Wing. He wants to intercept one of these weapons falling, and it just so happens to be the one that our crew is going for as well. When it goes into the battle view, we see a yellow ship. This is some guy named Hero, also from Gundam Wing. Apparently the rumored weapons appearing were just people flying to Earth in their own ships. Zex shows up and realizes it's someone ready to fight. So they attack, but it turns out Hero's super strong and they get owned. Zex attaches himself to Hero's mech and they both blow up, ejecting in the process. Our crew shows up next and Zex wants to run away. But I guess Gale orders him to quit being a baby and fight, so Zex stays. After a few turns of fighting, you'll never guess who shows up. Gale and Carla. This time though, they seem like they mean business. I think Gale is ready to fight to the death. And Zex runs away, I guess. I parked AG next to Gale to do that V-Max attack again, but instead a talk option appeared. So I talked, and I guess AG didn't like what he heard. He powered up and rammed him, and that's the end of Gale. Surely the battle must be over there, right? Nah, Rich shows up for some reason. He tells Selene she's hot, and that he needs that mech back. And, uh, Selene says she's gonna cut off his junk. Uh, yeah, I would not mess with her. Oh yeah, remember how I said you get a game over if Captain Bright dies at any time? Yeah, I didn't know that yet at this point of the playthrough, and uh, Rich killed him. Had to do the entire mission all over again. After I beat it, AG was all sad about Gale dying, but eh, what can you do? AG's a tough guy, right? We get introduced to a new big character here, Trey's Kushrenata. Both he and Zex are talking about how Gale died in action, and Zex really screwed up destroying that mech from Operation M. But I guess it isn't punished as Trey says he's giving Zex a special mech called the Lightning Baron. And then we get an update on Hero. He runs into some girl named Relena, and he gets scared and runs away. Maybe she had cooties. Getting confused on the story? Well, if you aren't, don't worry. You will get confused. So our crew is talking after the mission, wondering about Operation M. Apparently all the pilots wiped out the fighters where they landed, except for Hero. We hope we can meet up with them someday. Speaking of Hero, apparently he's enrolled himself in a school for whatever reason. And for another weird reason, he can access the Empire's military database from that school. Oh yeah, that girl Relena is in his class too. Meanwhile, Julia, who is Eiji's sister, goes to the Imperial base and meets up with Carla. Carla goes off about how her and Gale were lovers. Like, chill Carla, come on, Julia was married to him. Julia says she wants to avenge Gale, even if she has to kill her own brother. Before the battle, we meet a girl named Fa and a boy named Camille. They're hiding out near a special force troop from the Empire. The people in that special force are Cacricorn and Jared. They see Camille and make fun of his name. I don't know, seems like a decent name to me. Then they all get in a fight. They accuse him of being with the Resistance, so now it's time to fight for real. They've also got this girl named Layla with them. These three are a big pain throughout the game. Camille goes rogue and steals a Gundam from an Imperial hangar and joins the fight with us. Some girl named Emma freaks out. We meet Commander Basque here too, and he's livid that some random kid is stealing one of their mobile suits. This mission introduces multiple types of terrain to the mix. Flying troops aren't affected by it, but ones that move on land are. So here, Selene has her movement range heavily restricted due to traveling through water. Mountains are definitely the worst though. This mission was so easy. Camille is just in the corner, surrounded by all the enemy troops, and he whoops all of them. Even Cacricorn gets owned. As usual, a bunch of new enemies show up. This happens like every single mission. Now we're dealing with this new guy named Guilar. I have no idea if I'm saying that right. He's brought along both Julia and Gostero's gang to give Commander Bast support. After these guys showed up, I learned how strong Ro actually is. 
In fact, she was one of my top team members throughout the entire game. If she's one tile next to an ally, she can heal them for quite a lot. And it takes no energy, so she can use it as much as she wants. Only once per turn, though. So I killed most of the enemies pretty easy. Eiji just didn't care, and he burnt Julia to a crisp. And yeah, that was the end of that. To be honest, most of the time in these battles are spent killing regular enemies, which usually die in one shot and they can't hit you. The game's pretty easy for the most part, so I'm just like briefly skimming over these battles. Plus trying not to make this video longer than the Titanic. There are some missions later on that really took some strategizing though. With that battle over, we've added Camille to our squad. Anne is all upset because Eiji fought his own sister and she doesn't want anyone to fight. Come on, Anna, this is an anime. That's what we do here. But then we meet this dude named Hankin. He and General Blex are talking about something called Zeon's Red Comet. Apparently, it was something related to the Zeon faction in the war before the Mu Zorbatos Empire invaded. He thinks Quattro has ulterior motives or something like that. I don't know, the story's hard to follow. And then finally, we get an update on Hero. Relena is really prying to get some details out of him as to who he really is. Hero's not interested in being friends, so he pulls out a gun to shoot her. But then out of nowhere, some dude named Duo shows up and points a gun at him. Duo shoots Hero, but he still manages to run away, despite the wound. Hero wonders why Duo has the same kind of mech he does, and Relena's just freaking out. I think Hero doesn't want to talk to you, like, come on. So now it's on to mission 6. Hey, trust me when I say I'm cutting down this lore drastically. There's enough text in this game to fill up a novel. So it turns out the Imperial forces have a new commander now. His name is Lecane, and he's Governor Gresco's son. He's talking with Giolar on who should be higher ups in commanding the troops. He elects Trays and some new guy named Rowan Demetrich. Our crew is trying to stop this rogue guerrilla unit who has a plan to assassinate Lecane as soon as he takes office. We think they're going to get absolutely owned, but they want to do it anyway. Bright mentions that they're from New York, so <laughs> it makes sense they're being reckless. And then it goes to the battle view. It shows like a cutscene, I guess you could call it, where the gorillas attack and kill the cane and all his forces. They're all high on their easy victory when a ton of new troops show up. And even crazier, one of them is Lecane. Apparently the one they killed was a fake. Then Lecane kills a bunch of the gorillas and our guys show up just in time. Now we've got to help these guys escape because they're way in over their head. The Empire has Gustero, who apparently didn't die. He's like a cyborg now, and he's way stronger. Normally, your goal is to kill all the enemies to win, but in this mission, that's irrelevant. The guerrilla troops are a third yellow faction, so they'll have their own turn group after mine and the enemies. We have to stall the other people long enough for them to reach the bottom of the screen so that they can escape. Oh yeah, and Rich shows up a bit into the battle, because why not? Let's just bring in the whole universe here. So after a few turns, the gorillas made it out safely. Then it told me I had to escape to a green zone as well. Although I was kind of whooping all the other guys. I didn't realize I also had to escape and yeah, Bright got surrounded and died. Rip. After finishing the mission, we meet Lecane's father, Gresco. He's wondering why Lecane wanted to kill a bunch of rebels because if the Empire's too violent, people wouldn't want to work with them. Lecane thinks he's an idiot and tells him he's becoming soft. We also meet a new character, Lady Une. She's another higher up in the Romefeller Foundation, along with Trays. And finally, we meet Howard. He kind of looks like Master Roshi from Dragon Ball. He's wondering why Duo's trying to get rid of his Gundam, and Duo realizes Hero must have taken it apart to use for spare parts to fix his own. And then it's on to Mission 7. We find Lady Une leading some troops to kill someone named Minister Darlian. Apparently, he's Relena's father. They try to capture her, but this guy named Alan rescues her. He's part of Karaba, another anti-imperial organization. He does reveal that Darlian left a final message for Relena before he died. He says he's not her biological father, and her real name is Relena Peacecraft. Her family made a stand in the name of total pacifism, but her parents were assassinated. Darlian took her in and raised her as his own. Also, Lady Une and Trays have put out false intel about the top officials in the Empire going to a meeting at New Edwards. And unlucky for us, Captain Bright is totally buying it. Meanwhile, Hero and Duo met up and are flying there together. Then we meet someone new, Quatre and Troa. Don't confuse Quatre with Quatro. Oh my god, there's so many characters and it just gets way more complex. These guys are also from Gundam Wing and they just so happen to be heading to New Edwards. 
Yet another new Gundam Wing character enters the mix. This guy's name is Wu Fei, and he's paid some soldiers to bring him an absurd amount of ammo to stockpile near New Edwards. Safe to say, something's about to go down. When I got into the mission, I had a new unique goal. I had to move three of my troops into the green zone, which is where the higher ups are meeting. Some guy named Noventa is in the meeting with Trays, and he's so confused. This meeting is for Governor Gresco to achieve peace with the Terrans in the Empire, but Trays and the Romefiller Foundation provoke this attack to ruin the meeting. He makes Noventa flee on a spacecraft. A few turns into the battle, all the Gundam Wing peeps spawned into the battle. They act as a third party, although they'll be on our side. Then Emma starts to feel suspicious why this attack's even happening. She thinks it was all a setup. Then Gostero and his alien crew show up. Apparently they're calling themselves the Death Ogre Squad now. It's kind of wild how many different battles play out in this game. There's story-based events where certain matchups happen. So Hero and Zex got in a battle and Zex remembered him from before. But uh, Hero just whipped out a shield and tanked it, then blasted Zex in one shot. After that, an enemy Garuda spawned. Of course, we assume that's Lycane and the other leaders of the Empire, so now we've got to blow it up before it escapes. This mission introduces the first ridiculous enemy ship. The one Commander Basque was piloting had 22,000 HP. It just takes so long to kill it, my goodness. After taking out everyone else, I had Quattro blow up the Garuda. And oh god, that's Noventa inside. Uh, I think we messed up. And yep, Wufei shows up and he's like, hey, y'all killed the peacekeepers. This whole thing was a setup by Lacane and Trey's Kusrenata. Well, I guess it's time for us to hit the old dusty trail. Pretty much everyone scattered after that, but Duo and Quatre stayed around. We asked them if they wanted to join the squad and they were like, yeah, sure, why not? Now it's on to mission eight. Our crew is fleeing the area under hot pursuit. One of the special ships catches up to us, but they're flying a white flag. We decide to let them board and see what's up. It's Emma, and she says she had a feeling this was all a setup, and she no longer wants to serve the Empire. Camille puts her in a room, and we decide to trust her slightly for now. But then the rest of the pursuers catch up, so it's time to fight. The people chasing us are none other than Jared, Layla, and Cacricorn from before. These guys show up so much, man. I did my usual thing, just blowing everybody up, mostly with Selene and Ag. The game was still pretty easy at this stage. After a couple turns in usual fashion, a bunch more enemies show up to make it take so much longer. This time it's Carla with a big crew. When I defeated all those clowns, a single enemy popped up, then two allied troops. These guys are Ryo and Domon. I believe they're from G Gundam. Domon does like some Super Saiyan type thing and his Gundam powers up. He's going off about how that enemy is definitely the Devil Gundam and he must destroy it. Quatre says the five of them were ordered to destroy it. The Devil Gundam was the sixth meteor that fell during Operation M. So now it's literally all of us versus the Devil Gundam. It just sits in place, not moving at all. This is, I guess, the first boss of the game. It has 25,000 HP and is quite strong, unlike Commander Basque's tanky ship. AG still did some insane damage to it though. His V-Max attack is nuts. Once I got its HP below 10,000, it just teleported away, and Domon was livid. This girl named Rain tries to calm him down. I think she's like his romantic interest or something? I don't know, I never watched G Gundam. Then it switches to some weird aerial map view. I don't think this ever gets used again in the game. We're talking about how there's probably some more planes coming at us, and wouldn't you know it, a few enemy planes appear right after. Just when we get surrounded, a yellow plane appears, and it's piloted by some guy named Amuro. He rams into them with a passenger jet and somehow wins. And he keeps calling Quattro Char for some reason. Apparently, Amuro is some legendary warrior, and the Empire had him under arrest, but he was able to escape during the incident at New Edwards. Everyone's just fangirling over him, basically. Ryo and his friend Hayato were sent here from Karaba to aid us as well. Dovan basically just lives his life to destroy the Devil Gundam. We learn it's piloted by someone named Kyoji Kashu, who just so happens to be Domon's brother. And finally we get a glimpse into Amuro and Char's relationship. It's not elaborated upon, but I guess they have some history with each other from a long time ago. Well, guess what? It's on to Mission 9 now. We meet a new guy, General Igor, one of the higher ups in the Earth Defense Force. He says he needs us to go to Kansas City and assist the rebels there. I guess the people there are fed up with the Empire. We agree, as long as we have some reinforcements. The people we get are the Beast Fighter Corps, Sarayuki, Ryoshiba, and Masato Shikibu. 
Masato is obsessed with women. It's pretty much all he ever talks about. We also get a girl named Bell Torchica to join us. She never really goes into battle, she's more like a person who helps run things in the main ship. And finally, Astonage joins the crew. He doesn't battle either, but he performs maintenance on everyone's ships. When it goes into the mission, we see some specials attacking the town, and Hero goes in to stop them. Relena Peacecraft is there, and they want to take her prisoner. Hero sends out some massive beam attack to save her, and he's just like, why did I do that? Then he runs away. Huh? I think he likes her. Then these new people show up. Some creepy guy with a horn named Dr. Gura and a literal demon just called the Great General of Darkness. Apparently they are Mycenae and Hyaki clan forces. Demons who decided to side with the Muse Zorbato's empire. Amuro is talking about joining the fight, but he thinks he's washed up. As you might be able to tell by now, our squad is huge by this point, and there's a limit to it. It turns out you can only have up to 15 people in a single battle. From now on, I had to choose the 15 people I wanted to use. For the most part, it didn't matter too much. I just needed to make sure I had Ro to heal and Selene and Eiji to deal damage. Plenty of others were good too, like those new Gundam Wing guys. It became real frustrating to know who I was choosing because I can't read Japanese. I spent a long time memorizing which names were the ones I actually wanted. After killing a bunch of people, some new guys spawned in. This was Tekoki of the Hyaki clan. He's all about honor and he wants to have a fair fight with us humans. Dr. Gura thought he was being an idiot and said they should use any tricks they can to steal our Getter Robo. Tekoki totally wasn't cool with dirty tactics, so he just left. That was easy. Oh yeah, Duo has this really cool attack called Death Sight. I think this is a memorable thing from the anime, because people were excited to see it. Man, this is where the mission started taking quite a bit longer. The enemies were becoming larger in number and in HP. Many of the regular troops had near 10,000 health, and the General of Darkness had 20,000. Dr. Gura had 21,000. Also, what's up with his ship? It's a bunch of shades of green and pink and blue, it's just so weird. It took nearly an hour to kill all the enemies, but I did it. We decided to take in any wounded refugees from the city, and Selene runs into this girl named Leela. She's clearly injured, but she doesn't want to come with us, uh, so we force her to go. We decide to go to Hong Kong for more supplies, and Leela's freaking out about it. But like, she's injured, so we gotta take care of her, you know? Sarah leaves temporarily to go find Shinobu, who I guess was the fourth member of the Beast Fighter Corps. He's like, I'm never fighting again, go away and she calls him a big baby and that the Empire is worth fighting against, but he's not having any of it. So we'd made it to Hong Kong, one of the only cities in the world still ran by Terran government. Amuro is still not wanting to fight because he thinks he's washed up, so Belter Chica says if he fights, she'll be his girlfriend. But Amuro doesn't really seem interested. Poor girl. A bunch of people go into town to get supplies for the team. Hey, still with me? We're going to Mission 10. Camille goes into town and runs into a strange girl. She says her name is Four Murasame. Kind of strange since we learned about a lab called Murasame trying to engineer superhumans. Then we meet a new character, Dr. Hazuki. I believe he's a character with the Getter Robo crew. He brought a bunch of new mobile suits and even a new pilot. Her name is Simone and I guess David knows her. I think she was in that battle with everyone three years ago as well. Then we see Lady Une talking to some crazy looking guy named Wong. I guess he's running those experiments on superhumans and they want to unleash them on the resistance right now. He agrees, but then it shows an unknown character and maybe Won has a plan of his own that he's going to execute. So it goes back to Camille and Four and they're both feeling lonely so they decide to make out. Kinda random, but okay. Suddenly a bunch of Imperial forces show up and Four says she's got a horrible headache. Then it cuts to the battle view. It starts off as just a regular old battle, nothing special, although the map is pretty lavender looking. After a few turns of battle, Shinobu shows up. Guess he does want to fight after all. With all four pieces of Dan Kuga here, they can fusion to form a super robot. I got a Muro to fight with for the first time in this mission too, and man, he's a beast. Definitely one of the MVPs of this game. In usual fashion, a ton of enemies spawn when you think you've almost won. One of them is a unique looking ship, and Four is the one piloting it. Quattro got a new mech in this mission as well, and it's awesome. He gains a beam attack that hits all enemies in a line. These kinds of attacks are the only way to take out multiple enemies in a single turn, and it saves a lot of time in the long run. This mission in particular took nearly an hour to finish. Four was in a really strong robot with 20,000 HP. I think you're supposed to use Camille to get her to join your team, but 
I decided to just kill her. After the battle, Amura was like, that girl was in the Psycho Gundam, stay away from her at all costs. And Camille was like, no way dude, she actually likes me. We're gonna be together forever. And then he runs off. Oh yeah, and that Leela girl we picked up in Kansas City never left. Apparently she didn't want to stay there so badly. She joined us as a new fighter now too. Next up, it's Mission 11. Lady Une is bloodthirsty and wants to send more superhumans at the Resistance. Zex is like, hey, maybe we should let off for a bit. And then a new character shows up. Her name is Noeen and she's another higher up in the Romefeller Foundation. She says surely Trey's wouldn't want to continue attacking, but she's like, know your place, trash. Meanwhile, our crew is hearing about these fighters showing up out of nowhere as if they're warping into the world. No one seems to know who they are, and they don't seem to be allied with any known factions. Sarah and the rest of Dan Kuga gang are talking about some guy named Shapiro. Apparently he used to be Sarah's lover, and he defected to the Empire, but no one knows where he is, or if he's even alive still. Then Celine notices two fighters who appear out of nowhere, so time to go investigate that nonsense. Into the mission view, we see just two troops fighting each other. The guy's named Sho, and the girl is named Garalia. They say they're from the Bison Well and something strange is going on there. Oh my god, this is that guy I played as in Super Robot Spirits. Sho, he was the guy trying to get back to the Bison Well. They're in this game too. Sho's even got the little fairy with him, Cham. You're actually not supposed to fight Garalia here, so I just kept running away. Eventually all of my crew showed up and were like, hey, identify yourselves. We gotta make sure you're not with the Empire. Of course, they're from the Bison Well, which is like an alternate world, so they have no clue what the heck we're talking about. Eventually, we decide, ah, well, let's trust them and let them come aboard. Before they can, though, a bunch of enemies show up. Some guy named Bjorn is out to kill, and he wants Sho dead specifically. Sho tries to get them to work together since everyone is being banished from the Bison Well, but Bjorn is having none of it. We're like, hey, uh, what do we do? And Sho's like, kill that dude. So we listen, even though we literally just met him five minutes ago. So as you might guess, Sho and Garalia join our team now. Sho is insanely powerful. He doesn't deal the best damage, but he dodges enemy attacks so easily. I typically would send him out to bait all the attacks while my heavy hitters struck from far away. Anyway, I kick those guys' butts pretty easy. In typical Super Robot Wars fashion, a bunch of new enemies appeared to make the battle last even longer. It was one of those superhumans from before, with four in one of the suits. I killed her again, although I think if you try to save her with Camille, she sacrifices herself anyway. So after the fight, we're talking with Sho. It turns out he's a Terran who was sent to the Bison Well, so he's kind of controversial there. They don't know why, but everyone's being transported to Earth from there against their will. They suspect something sinister's going on. Hankin comes back to give us our new orders. Head to Beijing and meet with the International Police Org there. He's given us a new pilot to work with, Fa. If you recall, Fa was earlier in the story. I think she's Camille's sister, and she says the Empire sent their parents to prison, so she joined the Resistance. Then we catch a glimpse of Drake, who's like the leader of the Bison Well. He's talking with someone unknown. And even Drake is unsure why ships are being sent to Earth. And finally we see Lady Une upset the superhumans lost that battle, but she's like, send more in! Noeen comes back saying she has orders directly from Trace for her to stop, and she's like, but I'm supposed to be in control. Noeen handles it elegantly instead of going all ragey like Lady Une did. There's not really any important storyline before Mission 12. People are just kind of freaking out about Chan being a fairy. We see an unknown aircraft, so we go into battle positions to prepare for the worst. We see a single enemy ship and a girl named Genrei and an old man named Professor Yumi. They're being harassed by some weird looking guy named Q-Boss. He wants a briefcase that the professor has for whatever reason and he's gonna kill for it. They're running away and then some kid named Daisaku shows up in the giant robo. Q-Boss is freaking out and for good reason because Daisaku kills him in one punch. The three come to our craft and it turns out they're people from the IPO we were supposed to be meeting with. Professor Yumi's lab was attacked by the Empire and that briefcase contained all the research data. And wouldn't you know it, Daisuku wants to bring the giant robo to join our team. We're upset cause he's just a kid and he says, hey, I'm 12 years old. <laughs> I guess that's old in his eyes. We meet some new guy named Director Chujo. He's here to bring bad news though. Apparently the Empire is launching a large scale operation to wipe all resistance bases off the map. None of us heard about this, but apparently it's because they hit it so well. We decide we should probably run away immediately, but uh, too late, the Empire's here. 
Basically, it's all the big alien bad guys in this mission, including Gostero and his gang. After a few turns of battle, three new allies show up, the Mazinger crew. They're in the Karaba organization, and their names are Koji, Sayaka, and Boss. Sayaka is Professor Yumi's daughter. Boss is like the most worthless character ever. He dies so fast and does no damage. But if you can get him next to an enemy, he can have his robot self-destruct, dealing decent damage. The issue is that it's basically impossible to get him next to someone without dying. The battle's pretty standard, although the average strength of an enemy troop is noticeably higher now. Some of my team members were kind of worthless by this point. Once I'd killed a few of them, Ritz showed up with his crew, just for good measure, you know? Can't have the battle ending too early. He's all like, oh, Celine, baby, I came here all the way just to see you. And she's like, oh my god, go away, you're so gross. After defeating about half the enemies, Bell Torchica decides we're all screwed, so we just run away. I lost quite a few troops too, so I didn't gain much money. We managed to escape, but apparently 45 resistance bases were obliterated in the attack. Anywhere we can land for repairs is destroyed, and Domon's freaking out because he won't be able to chase the Devil Gundam. That's literally all he ever talks about. Sho is looking for new info about people appearing from the Bison Well, and it seems the troops coming in have stopped attacking any Imperial forces. Sho can't believe Drake would align with them, but he knows he has an advisor who may secretly be with them. But regardless, the next thing to do is repair the ship, and Quatre knows about a secret base. The Magnac Corps have hidden their base under a town, so the Empire wouldn't have known they even existed. Our next destination is the Middle East. So here we go, mission 13. Duo is talking about some group called the Saints of Cusco. They've been doing non-violent protests against the Empire. Everyone's surprised they haven't been killed yet because they would have no way to defend themselves. Apparently A.G. believes the leader of it is his sister, so he takes off to investigate. So we reach the Maganak core base and Rashid is there to greet everyone and fix our ships. He's telling us that the specials are preparing to launch into space and run their commands from there. They're supposed to be launching from Lake Victoria in Africa. Before we have time to leave, the base becomes under attack by the Empire. Guess they followed us here, whoops. Wufei's waiting outside the base with some girl named Sally for the Empire to attack. Noeen shows up and notices him, but is like, eh, it's just a kid. Then Wufei hops in his Gundam and kicks all their butts. He says he doesn't kill weaklings, so he lets her go. We show up, so Wufei leaves and lets us finish the fight. As usual, after killing a bunch of enemies, a bunch of new people show up to fight us. This time it's sex to give Commander Basque some backup. And then, after a few more turns, Ina spawns with even more troops. I think we met her like 10 episodes ago? I'm not sure. I think you're supposed to be able to try to save her with Shiro, but I just killed her. Sometimes during battle, the people from G Gundam can power up. So like here, Domon is looking all crazy and his attacks get way stronger. He deals insane damage like this, but it can be hard to get him in this state. I think you have to deal a lot of damage to get there. This mission was a step up in difficulty. There's so many enemies, and sometimes you get unlucky with the enemy hitting through a low hit chance. Selene died and I was cornered, and yeah, Zex got Captain Bright in one hit. Rip an hour and a half of fighting. The next time around, Selene didn't get killed early, and I managed to take them all down. But of course, it wasn't over yet still. That guy Takoki from the Hyaki clan shows back up, and he's ready to have his fair fight against us. Oh my god, it never ends. Thankfully, it's only three more troops, and I made it out. Good riddance. After the battle, we see that Eiji's suspicions were right. His sister, Julia, is the leader of the Saints of Cusco. Eiji doesn't really understand what she's doing, but then Relena shows up and says they're working to achieve perfect peace so they refuse to carry weapons. They are planning to meet with Governor Gresco to discuss a truce between the Empire and the Terrans. Meanwhile, Lecane is with Giular, wondering who the heck the Saints of Cusco are and why they're coming there. When Giular tells him they're going to appeal to Governor Gresco, he calls him an idiot and orders him to arrest them. He's also becoming suspicious that there may be a spy within his ranks. Then Captain Bright tells us about a secret weapons reserve in South America that was constructed during the war. The Empire was meant to destroy it, but they never did, so we're going to head there to get some new firepower. Hey, guess what? Time for mission 14. Lacane is busy talking with Gular, wondering how citizens are obtaining so many weapons. He's mad that he doesn't have any useful info when an unknown character pops up knowing exactly where we're about to head. Lacane loves this, and he mentions that this guy's going to bring troops from the Bison Well. 
Uh-oh, I think it's that guy Drake was talking to. And yeah, Sarah mentions that Shapiro is the only one who could have told them because he knew about the base way back in the day, too. There's also a bunch of Imperial troops amassing at the location of the base, but we're gonna go anyway. Finally, we see Lacane arguing with Greska because he picked up the Saint of Cusco and is bringing her to the Imperial HQ. Lacane is furious, but Greska says, mind your own business, little boy. So into the battle itself, we arrive at the Nazca base, and it's getting obliterated. We realize the base is lost and decide to abort the mission, but then a bunch of enemies spawn, trapping us from behind. Sho realizes those fighters are from the Bison Well and that Drake must have sided with the Empire. His old teammate Todd is out there fighting against him now. After picking my team, we see Drake talking with Shapiro about how this battle will show everyone that his forces are even stronger than the Empire's. There's also someone else with him named Luna, who I guess is someone Shapiro brought along. And of course, Alan and Todd are there fighting alongside Drake. After a few turns have passed, Sarah calls out Shapiro. They start arguing, and I guess he was the one who taught the Dan Kuga crew everything they know. But he's evil now, so uh, yeah, time to die. A few turns later, and Dr. Gura says they have nothing left to gain in this fight, so the Hyaki clan should pull out. But then some dude named Gugaki is like, oh my god, this is my first ever battle. I have to live up to my father's reputation. Dr. Gura is like, suit yourself, I'm out of here. Peace. Seems kind of reckless if you ask me. And yet another insane twist, two allied troops spawn a bit after that. These are Jun and Tetsuya from the Karaba group. I think they're from the Great Mazinger anime? Not too sure. This is a great thing to happen though, because Jun is also a healer. So now I finally have a second healer in case Ro gets picked off or something like that. This battle's pretty uneventful other than that for the most part. The only notable thing is Drake was in this gigantic fortress and it had 45,000 HP. It's just obnoxious when they have that much because it takes forever to take it down. Before I could get his health down all the way, Shapiro told him to retreat. He was like, hey, what's with the weakness, buddy? And Shapiro's like, uh, uh, well, the base got destroyed and it doesn't matter because we're the strongest ever. Well, yeah, but why did you get wrecked by me then? After the battle, we notice one of the Aura battlers that are used in the Bison Well is crashed nearby. We investigate and learn it's Sho's friend Marvel. We bring her on board and she says that her other friends, El and Ciela, are under fire nearby and need help. We decide it's in our best interest to help them because we need more robots in our army, of course. Later on, we see the Hyaki clan and Gukangi is not happy. His son was Gugaki, that dude who went all Leroy Jenkins in the last fight, and he's going to do everything in his power to avenge his son's death. Emperor Bri, who is a leader of the Hyaki clan, offers his full arsenal of troops to fight us. Oh my god, it's still going. On to mission 15 we go. So this is the first point you have to make a choice in the storyline. There's currently two motherships from the Bison Well that are under heavy Imperial fire. Queen Ciela's Grand Galan and Queen El's Gorion. We have to make a choice as to which ship we attempt to save because it's impossible to have both. The Grand Galan is more of a tank and the Goron is more offensive focus. I went with the Gorion. After choosing, we see another conversation between Governor Gresco and Lacane. Still, Lacane is upset that Gresco is keeping secrets from him. Gresco reminds him that he's the leader of the entire empire and Lacane is merely the leader of the military. He believes keeping these things secret from Lacane for his own safety and promises all will be revealed if he comes back tomorrow. Then we go into the mission view. We get a message from General Black saying that the Imperial attack on the resistance bases was very successful. It turns out our group is the only one left with any kind of fighting strength. We're the resistance's last hope. There's a few places in Asia where the Empire missed, so we need to meet up with them. This battle doesn't have anything special or even lore updates in it. There was one thing I learned in that the game has a mechanic called a love bonus. Certain characters love each other romantically, and if you put them next to each other, they receive a buff. I think it only increases their damage output, but it's interesting nonetheless. One really funny thing is there's also an unrequited love bonus. Some characters love someone, but they aren't loved back so only the one in love actually gets the buff. I know that feeling all too well. Anyway, now when Sho and Marvel are near each other, they receive a buff. Well, actually, there is one thing that happens here. After you kill all the other people, Gukenki appears. You know, that dude is in the Hyaki clan and his son died. Anyway, he got wrecked too, and the mission was finally over after over an hour. After the battle, we now have Queen El's mothership to our arsenal, as expected. 
There's also this guy named Ko from the resupply who we've taken, although I literally never used him. Then there's a pretty significant story event that happens. So like Kang goes back to Gresko's office the next day like he was told. Gresko reveals that he does have Julia held there and Lacane is like, what the heck man, why are you doing this? Julia tells him that both Terrans and Gradosians have the same common ancestors, Gradosians being the people of the Musor Vados Empire. Lacane can't believe this because he's racist and thinks Gradosians are superior in every way. Gresko tells him what she's saying is true and he's in shock. Gresko gets mad and says, oh Lacane, you're just a kid. I should have never given you any power. People respect a ruler who respects them, not someone who rules as a tyrant. So he wants to create an alliance between Gradosians and Terrans. Lacane is totally not cool with this, but Gresko relieves him of all his duties. And then Lacane just gets mad and pulls out a gun and kills Gresko. In his final words, Gresko says he must keep the truth of his death a secret for the fate of the Empire. And he has to kill Julia too. Man, this Lacane guy's a big loser. Wow, I can't believe you're still here. On to Mission 16. News of Governor Gresko's death is spread all across the world. Lacane is now the sole leader of the Empire. He's announcing that he's forming an alliance with loyal Terrans and promoting Roan and Trey's to commanding officers. Trey's announces a plan to destroy all the remaining rebels with an all-out attack. Our troops are worried that this time we may not be able to make it out, especially since all the other rebels have been wiped out. Meanwhile, Shapiro and Luna are talking about how they can't believe Lacane intends to work with Terrans. He sees the Muse Sorvatus Empire is weak now, and I guess he has plans of his own to take it over. He wants to contact some sort of asteroid base in space. Not really sure what he's talking about. Then he says he's going to work with Dr. Gura and the Hyaki clan. After that, we see some guy named Arthur talking with Rowan. He believes Rowan's an inside agent in the Muse Empire, acting in the best interest of the Terrans. Rowan is all like, I don't know what the heck you're talking about. And then we go into the battle. Despite all the resistance bases being wiped out, we do get some new forces this time around. Troa, Hero, and Wufei from Gundam Wings show up and decide to fight with us. They say they're just doing it to give themselves the best chance of survival, but hey, I'll take it. The battle's pretty standard, but it's super long. It starts with Gular and his crew. Then after killing a bunch of those dudes, Zex and Nuin appear. They're out for blood, although I think Trace doesn't want them to be. And if that wasn't enough, a huge portion of the Mycenae army spawns even later on in the battle. I'm pretty used to fighting everybody in the entire world at this point. I beat this one easily as well, although it took an hour and a half. After the mission, Rowan is in command of the Imperial Army. They can't attack without him giving an order, so they're begging him to order them to prevent our escape. However, he orders all Imperial troops to fall back, then reveals he has a bomb planted in the building that will kill them if they don't obey. Oh snap, Rowan going rogue. Trey seems happy that Rowan did this, then he flees the area with Lady Yune. Lake Kang confronts Rowan and he's obviously upset, but he also kind of respects him. Rowan says he is a Terran, first and foremost, so he had to look out for his own kind. Lake Kang mentions how the generals from the asteroid base are now going to come to Earth and there will be much more suffering than there would have been under him. Apparently they're called the Zakar. Lake Kang leaves, but he promises he'll return someday. Alan's upset Rowan let him live, but they got bigger issues, so they both flee as well. So now it's on to mission 17, and uh, this is where things get a bit weird. So I mentioned forever ago that I was using a translation of the game written on a site called Akarusu. Well, the person creating that translation only did up to mission 16. I thought we were screwed and would either have to ignore all the story or use the Papago app to individually translate every screen of text. Both options sucked. Thankfully, one of my viewers found a very obscure Japanese site where someone had transcribed all of the text in the game for every single mission. It was in Japanese, but I was able to paste the text into something like DeepL to translate it in mass. It's not a great translation, but it's enough to get by. Anyway, the point of this is to say that the accuracy of the storyline from this point may be a bit off. Oh, and in finding this site, we learned just how big this game is. As the person who made it created a flowchart for all the missions in the game. And my goodness, thank god we only have to follow a single path through this flowchart. I imagine 100%ing this game would take a minimum of 350 hours, but probably more. Anyway, guess I'll take a moment to talk about the graphics. They're... well, during a battle it literally looks like a SNES game. I don't think it's too bad, but man, it's wild to see this on the N64. I do think the attack animations look pretty solid though. 
The music, on the other hand, is absolutely fantastic. It's basically the theme songs of all the different animes featured in the game. The one from G Gundam is an absolute banger, not gonna lie. I don't know what all you're hearing of it in this video, and it's probably getting copyright claimed, but oh well. Anyway, back to Mission 17. Alan calls us and tells us how the Imperial HQ is no longer functional, and how it's all thanks to Rowan acting as an inside agent. He mentions the forces from the asteroid base coming and how Lecane is currently on the run. He thinks we can intercept him if we know where he's going. Alan gives a hint that we'll be able to find him at some area in Japan, so that's where we're headed next. Before we can even process this, Domon barges in and is like, Where is it? Where is the Devil Gundam? Apparently, Amuro learned the Devil Gundam will also be in that part of Japan. Domon's like, Screw you guys, I'm gonna go kill him once and for all. But then the Gundam Wing crew remind him their job was to destroy the Devil Gundam as well, so they'll go with him. Apparently the place we're headed is the ruins of Tokyo. Well, when we get into the battle view, a bunch of enemy troops appear. Then an unknown person appears, followed by their Gundam. They kick all the bad guys' butts. They're freaking out, saying he did it with his bare hands. Ah, oh, looks like he's not in a Gundam at all, because it shows a battle view with him, and he does like a Shoryuken to blow up one of the enemy robots. It turns out this is the person who taught Domon everything he knows, Master Asia. Then Domon gets out and does some crazy kick punch move thing to kill the remaining robots. Domon and Master Asia are busy catching up when Master Asia mentions he's also here because of the Devil Gundam. Their conversations cut short as the Devil Gundam's minions, the Death Army, begin to show up. We all get in our mechs and get ready to fight, and we're like, hey Master Asia, you gonna join us? And he's like, eh, I think I'll sit back and watch. Gee, thanks buddy. The fight's very standard. Once I defeated all the Devil Gundam's minions, some more enemies spawned in, as you might expect. This time, it was Lecane himself, along with Gostero and his gang. Lecane wants to kill Eiji because he's Julia's sister, I guess? I don't know, he's just so annoying. Just as annoying as his personality is, his battle tactics are even more annoying. When you hit him, he disappears in a puff of smoke. I'm sorry, what? This was actually a recurring mechanic that started on this mission. Many of the big time boss enemies would do this when you tried to hit them. I guess they're like using a decoy or something like that? You have to destroy the decoy like three or five times before you can actually deal damage. God, this fight's just so annoying. He just kept dodging over and over. After over an hour and a half, I finally took him out. Not before he killed half my team though. After the battle, Master Asia assures us that those troops were definitely being controlled by the Devil Gundam, and he's in this area for sure. He asks Domon to fight alongside him against it. Then we see a distress signal that knows our group's code, so we want to go investigate. Master Asia insists that firing weapons would be dangerous here, so only people skilled in physical combat should come with him. So the Gundam Wing crew, along with Ryo and Masato. Master Asia insists we should split up, so Domon takes the others with him on a separate search. And from the way Domon goes, they fall into a trap. I believe these people are named Tibode, Sai Sai, Argo, and Georges. They're also from G Gundam, and they claim they've been infected by the Devil Gundam's influence and are here to kill Domon. He's super against the Devil Gundam, so now he's gotta fight his friends. So we keep going, on to mission 18. There's not too much that happens before the battle. Everyone's kind of freaking out about people being infected by the Devil Gundam to give them mind control. After that, an alarm goes off and we're under attack by another faction of the Death Army. During the battle, Rain walks into a building that she saw Master Asia go into. She's wondering why he'd do that when the Death Army's attacking the area. She gets ambushed by the Death Army troops, but then someone unknown saves her. She asks who he is, but he's like, uh, I'm in a hurry, so I'm just gonna go. The battle's standard at first. In fact, there's only regular troops. No big enemies at all. After destroying most of them though, all of Domon's former friends show up. They're ready to kill us all to please the Devil Gundam, and Domon's trying to make them come to their senses. But they're not having any of it because the mind control's way too strong. They were pretty easy to kill as well. However, after beating them, a bunch of enemies appeared that looked like them. Domon's all like, hey, what gives? We beat them, didn't we? Then Rain is like, Domon, one of those Gundams is piloted by Master Asia. He's under the influence of the Devil Gundam too, and he's the one who's causing all the trouble in this town. He's the one who got Domon's friends taken over by it. Master Asia tries to get Domon to join him by hypnotizing him, but Rain snaps him out of it. After that, some new Gundam with a guy named Joker appears. 
He says he's part of something called the Shuffle Alliance, which monitors all battles to prevent the extinction of mankind. Master Asia used to be a part of it, but he betrayed them by joining the Devil Gundam. Joker decides the best course of action is to give up his own life to break Domon's friends free of the Devil Gundam's mind control. So he just runs in and blows himself up. However, Master Asia lives on, and he summons the Devil Gundam to kill us. It's looking grim when a new person appears. Oh my god, there's so many people. It's hard for me to keep track, even now. This guy's name is Schwartz, and he's the one who saved Rain earlier. I don't know, I guess he's from G Gundam as well. He says defeating the Devil Gundam is the top priority, and he joins our fight. The battle was going smoothly when Master Asia came in to fight. He went for Selene and had a 100% chance to hit her, so I chose to defend. Even with that, it took over half her health, and she's my strongest one. Thankfully, I didn't have to get his health all the way down. Once it was like halfway down or so, he was like, dang, these dudes got hands, I'm out. Schwartz leaves as well, and that's the end of that battle. Man, it took nearly two hours to do that fight. After the battle, we have Domon's friends Tibidae, Sai Sai, Georges, and Argo, now free from the Devil Gundam's control. They were wanting to fight against the Empire anyway, so they decide to join us. Then these four girls walk in named Shirley, Cass, Janet, and Bunny. I have no idea who they are. Maybe the other four's girlfriends or something? I don't know. Then we see some dude named Shot talking with Drake and Shapiro. They're all saying it's time for them to make their move to take control of things now that Lekane's out of the way. They plan to have a meeting with the Imperial Generals very soon. You think we're near the end? Not even halfway. Time for mission 19. Our troops fly to Hawaii, and Captain Bright says our next destination is a place called Jaburo. The Imperial Army's decided to move their HQ there, and we're going to attack them before they get everything fully set up. It doesn't seem like a good plan, but it's not exactly a bad plan? Next we see someone new. I believe his name is Death Gare, and he's talking with Shapiro about how the Empire can take back control of the Earth Sphere. There's another new guy named Gildrone. I think these are the people from the asteroid base they were talking about before. They all agree the Terrans should have no say in the Empire and the Romefeller Foundation needs to go. They can't leave Trays in any kind of position of power. They do consider the Mycenae and Hyaki clan good allies to keep though. Next, we see the Hyaki clan leaders talking about some plot they have to transform human soldiers into demons. It turns out the Mycenae and Hyaki clan are going to form an alliance to overthrow the Empire itself. They want control of everything. Next, we go back to our crew, and they're talking about someone named Relena Dorian. She's that girl from earlier who learned her father was actually named Peacecraft. Well, now she's formed a new society called the Sunk Kingdom, and she's carrying on her father's dream of total pacifism. After that, on the 10 trillionth branch of this insane plotline, we see Lady Yoon and Trey's worried that Shapiro has sent a message of hostility to them. Some new guy named Jamatov shows up, and he says they have bigger plans for something called Oz. They're wanting to do something in space. Zex calls and informs them that the Resistance is headed to Jaboro, so now we've got to deal with that. The battle in this one's against Deathgayer and Gildrome. After a few turns, Gildrome's mad that he's losing, so he uses some kind of EMP-type attack that weakens all my troops for the rest of the battle. This freaking sucked. Not so much that it made things harder, but the battle took way longer. It's cause I was doing so much less damage. As per usual, after killing most of the enemies, a bunch of new guys show up. This time it's shot with the Bison Well crew. He's going off about how the Empire's weak, and this is the time to show how strong Drake is. Then, of course, yet another faction shows up. The Hyaki clan and Mycenae want a piece of us too. Can't let this game in so soon now, can we? This one was essentially an endurance test. I barely scraped by with just Selene, Sho, Quattro, and Hero left. They're my best fighters though, so it makes sense. After the battle, we're all huffing and puffing like, oh, that was an insane battle. Then a gigantic amount of specials appear with Zex at the lead. He comes at us not to fight, but with a proposition. He says the specials have rebranded themselves as Oz, and they've launched attacks on all Imperial bases all over the Earth's sphere. They want us to join them, since we're all humans. We must defeat the Muse Zorbatos Empire and vanquish them all. This is where a huge decision in the story happens. I had to decide whether or not to join Oz. Depending on what you choose, it goes into an entirely different branch of the storyline. That flowchart from the Japanese blog site just shows the sheer scope of this game's storyline. I decided to not join up with Oz and stay as an independent army. 
Not necessarily because that's what I wanted to do, but because the game's text was transcribed for that part of the story. So, uh, yeah, that's what I went with. We'll take their help against the Empire, but we don't trust them whatsoever. I genuinely cannot believe you're still here. I hope the video's good. Let's go to Mission 20. We meet this new guy named Delmail. He gives this big speech about how Oz are the new world government, and they will not answer to the Empire. The person leading them to this position is none other than Trey's Kushrenata. Trey's gives a big promise about how Oz will not rule with brutality, but instead work with the people of Earth to make everyone happy and sing Kumbaya and all that jazz. We're wondering what the future holds for ourselves when the battle alarms go off. We're under attack by the Empire. Drake is regretting that Shapiro convinced him to join up with the Empire considering the move Oz just made, but some guy calling himself the Black Knight shows up to help. He seems to have some kind of vendetta against Sho. Oh yeah, there's some new guy named Helmet, which just looks like a vampire version of the Joker, honestly. There was something really strange in this fight. One of the troops, who I believe is named Jeryl, did this crazy transformation when I killed her robot. She came back insanely strong with 23,000 HP and really high damage too. I don't recall there ever being anything like this in any other battle, so it's weird that they did it here. She's not even like a main character either. Just when I think it can't get any worse, Oz troops show up. There's some new guys here named Alex and Muller. They're being all cocky when Zex shows up. They say he's getting in their way, so Zex gets mad and tells them to come at him. Zex obviously kicks those guys' butts, but then Noeen shows up to calm him down. In the end though, we're still stuck fighting against Oz and Zex himself. I destroyed them pretty easily, but then someone new popped up. They say their name is Avi Lu, and they're upset at the fighting happening here. We can't detect anything about their ship. It's like something none of us have ever seen before. But they're all alone, so it should be an easy fight, right? Avi Lu doesn't move during the battle at all, just like the Devil Gundam. I brought all my troops nearby, and I was ready to go. I had my best people in front with the healers in the back. But to my surprise, they attacked the people all the way in the back. The range was so long. And on top of that, it did massive damage. Selene did some solid damage, but then she was hit by a counterattack which almost one shot her. Still, I had a lot of troops who were pretty strong. If we just piled it on for enough turns, eventually it'd die, right? Well, not so much. There's a big issue here. The boss heals 9,600 health and 5 energy every single turn. So even if I just chip away at the HP, there's no way I can keep up with that level of healing. I honestly wasn't even close to winning, and yeah, that was like an hour and a half down the drain. What's so annoying about this mission is Avi Lu is such a difficulty spike, but anytime you want to attempt the fight, you have to kill Drake's crew and then the Oz crew. It just adds so much unnecessary time in between attempts. I would try to play the earlier parts of the mission conservatively in order to have everything available for the Avi Lu battle. This definitely needed a plan, because there was no way I was winning without some kind of new strategy. The first part of that strategy was reliant on the fact that the boss doesn't move. Its longest attack could strike from 9 tiles away and expend 30 energy. So if I brought my mothership to that exact distance with my two healers around it, I could reliably sustain its attacks. With 25 energy being expended per turn, it would eventually run out. Sure, it still had other attacks, but they were considerably worse. The second part of the plan was once the energy was down. I would bring in my heavy hitters to attack more safely. However, the damage still wasn't quite there. This is where abilities come into play. All characters have certain abilities assigned to them, and they use what I believe is spirit energy. Fortunately for me, many of my fighters have an ability that doubled their damage. It shows this by them having a fire aura around them. This let Selene hit for nearly 10,000 damage in a single attack. She couldn't spam it though as the ability took 40 energy and she only had 128. On this first attempt, I got it down to about 16,000 HP but the power just wasn't there. Finally though, on the third attempt, I barely, barely took Avilu down. Oh my god, having to repeat the earlier parts of the battle sucks so much. I think this mission took over 6 hours to get past. We're all freaking out about how we somehow won when Abby Lou freaking respawns. Oh my god dude, I was about to lose my mind. Thankfully though, there's a story event to deal with this. The Getter Robo spawns and just latches onto her and they both explode. Apparently Musashi sacrificed himself to save all of us there, so uh, rip. 
We're all grieving when General Blex calls and is like, hey, get over to Lan Sandari right now. None of us have even heard of that place, but sure, whatever you say, sir. Later, Nguyen and Zex are talking about a new group who doesn't support Oz, the Sunk Kingdom. They know that they practice total pacifism and don't support the fighting Oz wants to do. Zex mentions something weird about how Relena is a lot like him and that they both had a pacifist father, except she's going for pacifism and Zex is going for all-out war. Next, we see Trey's with Zex, who says his actions today are unforgivable. Zex understands, but says he stands by what he did. Trey's then calls him Miliardo Peacecraft, and Zex seems to formally leave the Romefeller Foundation. Well, you know the drill. It's time for Mission 21. General Blex is talking about how the Earth Liberation Front and Karaba are no longer an organization. But he acknowledges that we still want to fight for the same ideals, so our forces are combining if we'd like. Essentially, all the characters we've seen so far that are on our side are all here meeting together. Everyone's just kind of catching up, you know? Later, we meet someone completely new. These guys are Albert and Komei. Albert is definitely evil looking. They aren't specific, but they're talking about how some kind of new product or weapon they have to offer. Then it cuts to Master Asia, so yeah, definitely evil. When it goes into the battle, it shows a cutscene first. Domon's wandering around outside his Gundam when he runs into Albert. They get into a fight and Albert absolutely kicks Domon's butt. Domon's like, oh my god, he's too strong, blah blah blah. But then Schwartz shows up and calls him a wimp. Domon gets mad and powers up, then he attacks Albert and kicks his butt. Next, the enemy shows up. They're led by some guy named Ivan, and that Q-Boss guy from like 10 missions ago. This mission was another one with a unique objective. The spot we spawn on is some kind of base, and we have to keep any enemies out of it. If they touch any of the indicated green tiles, it's game over. Or if we all die, of course. I kind of hated this one. There's so many of these ships that look like frogs. They have like 7,000 health, and they move quite a big distance each turn. This naturally makes it quite tough to keep them from the area. They barely harm you at all, but that doesn't matter in this case. And, uh, yeah. They easily broke through on my first try. Dang. At least I didn't have to repeat too much for a loss this time around. If you recall earlier, I had to choose between a tanky or offensive mothership like 20 years ago in an earlier mission. I opted for the offensive one, and it was big in this mission. It turns out it has a beam attack that covers a large area, so I was able to weaken four of those frogs at once. It was invaluable, and I'm not sure I would have won without it. This attempt, however, it still wasn't good enough. Oh my god, so frustrating. On the third try, I did hold them off. And of course, it just wasn't enough to please this game. The Mycenae army spawned in, and they're here to steal the Getter Robo. This part sucked even more because they have even higher HP than those dumb frogs. Some even have 12k, and they're crossing over water, which makes a lot of my team's attacks suck. Another game over. Oh my god. Thankfully, fourth time was the charm, and nobody touched the green area. No one else showed up. After winning, Albert runs into Master Asia in that area, and they fight for some reason. I guess they don't really like each other, I don't know. After that, Captain Bright's randomly talking about something called the BF Group. He says it's some secret society, but their leader and motivations are completely unknown. They are the ones who created the giant robo. Next, we learn Oz has been very successful in driving the Empire from the Earth Sphere. However, they weren't as successful at fighting the space colonies. So in a new turn of events, Oz has sided with the Empire and the colonies only. This means we're now fighting both Oz and the space colonies. Great, more people to show up after I think I've won a battle. Since we're against the colonies, the Gundam Wing crew decide they can't fight with us anymore, as it creates a conflict of interest. This really sucked for me because Hero was one of my best fighters. Oh yeah, and at the end, Zex gets in a fight with Oz or something, and his mask comes off. I guess he's going by Miliardo from now on. Woohoo, new mission! It's number 22 now. We're deciding what to make of Oz working with the colonies. We know they'll turn against us soon enough, but for now, we're focusing on the Earth itself. Our immediate threats are Drake, the Mycenae and Hyaki clan, and any remnants of the Musorbatos Empire. Meanwhile, Shapiro and Deathgay are arguing about the failure of the Empire on the ground. Shapiro seems to have bigger plans and wants everyone to go to the moon, as he has some kind of operation he's planning there. After that, we're clearly bored waiting on another fight and decide our group needs a new name. Seeing as we're no longer the Earth Liberation Front nor Karaba, we gotta call ourselves something. 
Amuro comes up with the name Marchwind, and we decide to roll with it. Next, there's some new guy named Kigman. I have no idea if I said that right. He talks about some Axis force moving towards Earth through the asteroid belt. Quattro seems to know what he's talking about, but who could at this point? This plot is absolutely insane. He also keeps calling Quattro Char like Amuro did before. Kind of strange. When we get into the battle view, we meet some dude named Kenji. He says he's part of the Cosmo Crusher Squadron. Guess he's part of our team or something now? Who knows at this point. We're battling against Death Gayer and the remnants of the Muse Zorbatos Empire. They're insanely easy to kill at this point, as they only have like 4000 HP. Remember, I upgrade my ships between every mission. And of course, after killing them all, more spawned in. This time it was Drake and the Bison Well crew. They went down with ease, and that was the end of the mission. Apparently Kenji isn't the only member of the old Cosmo Crusher squadron. There's four others, Takeru, Naoto, Akira, and Mika. I literally never use these people, but sure, they're on our team now. After that, Noeen shows up to speak with us. She says she's here as a representative of the Sunk Kingdom, the place practicing total pacifism led by Relena Peacecraft. Noeen wants us to come there to protect the kingdom. It seems super contradictory, but well, if someone decides to attack them anyway, they're kinda screwed, you know? There's a bit of an argument about helping them. The four people from the Beast Warrior Squadron along with Domon and the other G Gundam people don't want to come with us. The worst of all is Quattro decided to not come either. He was one of my best fighters. Also June didn't go and she was one of my healers. Hang in there everybody, we can do this. Time for mission 23. So we all head to the Sunk Kingdom and meet with Relena Peacecraft. She's glad to have us around and is talking about how the idea of perfect pacifism is spreading all throughout Europe. Despite this, we have to hide our robots in a top secret location so that everyone doesn't see the flaw in this ideal. Also, Amura randomly mentions how he thinks she's hot, so, uh, yeah. After we get all settled in, we receive a message directly from Noeen. Apparently, there's a giant battleship being prepared just outside the border of the Sunk Kingdom. With the way it's described, it definitely belongs to Drake. So uh, I guess we'll just sneak out back and take care of this. When it went into the battle, I realized Sho got a new mech. This thing was awesome because before all his attacks were melee, and now he had a strong long-ranged laser. That Black Knight guy from before is here with Drake. When I killed him, he transformed into a more powerful ship. He revealed himself to be Beern. You know, he was from one of the first missions with the Bison Well crew. Aw, oh, come on, I know you remember this guy. This one was pretty tough due to half my crew being gone. Thankfully, Selene, Eiji, Amuro, and Sho were enough to knock this one out. For whatever reason, by defeating these guys, it caused everyone from the Bison Well to be warped back there. I'm not sure why, maybe I missed it earlier in the lore or something like that? But that means Sho was gone from the team as well. Ugh. Oh wait, Sho and Queen L decided to come back anyway. I, I guess the devs didn't want them gone or something. Meanwhile, we see Commander Basque fighting the Empire on the moon. Jamatov and Delmail are there declaring Oz has taken control of the moon, and uh, that's it for that mission. Time for mission 24. We randomly see some new girl named Dorothy Catalonia, and she somehow has a meeting with Relena. She's like, oh my god, perfect pacifism? That's so cool, I want to learn all about it. Then she sees all of Marchwind and learns we're fighters here to protect the place. She then thinks to herself something about how her father would love this place, and she knows a great war is going to take place here soon. Hey, what the heck gives, Dorothy? Noeen comes to talk to us and mentions how they've built an energy laboratory to camouflage Marchwind hiding in a pacifist nation. Plus, our scientists really are here working on new energy sources, so it's technically not hypocritical? Then we get a view in space with Delmel and Jamatov. They've completely taken over the moon and are prepared to invade the asteroid belt. They talk about how their conquest of space is going extremely well. They'll move to conquer the Earth itself next. However, they're worried about the growing popularity of the Sunk Kingdom. Sure, they could invade them easily if they wanted, but it wouldn't be a good look. They also understand we're hiding there under the guise of researching energy. Meanwhile, the Mycenae and Hyaki clan are upset that Oz is conquering so much of the Earth sphere. They're worried they'll have to retreat into obscurity, when suddenly Dr. Guros shows up saying he knows exactly where Marchwind are hiding. In the Sunk Kingdom, of course. They want to go invade, but then consider this may be a trap to lure them in. Marquise Janice offers to disguise herself as a human and infiltrate the kingdom to figure out the truth. Marquise gets in easily, but some other people are doing the same thing at the same time. 
These people are Jude, Eno, L, Beecher, and Mondo. I think they're here to rob the place. Marquise discovers the secret entrance to our hangar and realizes Mazinger and Getter Robo are both in here. She plans to set a bomb, but then those five from earlier run into her and a fight breaks out. Astonage hears the commotion and sounds the alarm. Then we see this butler dude named Pagan, and he's informing Relena that the Mycenae and Hyaki clan have launched an all-out attack on the energy facility. Dorothy's freaking out, like, Oh my god, Relena, you're under attack! Whatever will you do? If you act with pacifism, you'll obviously be destroyed. Clearly, she's got some kind of motive here. When it cuts to the battle view, it shows Jude and the gang in one of our robots. They ended up stealing one after all, but they're all freaking out about how demons are showing up. So, I guess we gotta go save them even though we're going to protect the Sun Kingdom anyway. After killing a bunch of enemies, Marquise spawns in with even more demons. Honestly, would have thought she was already there fighting, but oh well. This one was super easy. It only took like 45 minutes. After the battle, we see Trey's and Lady Oon arguing. Also, Lady Oon looks way different now for whatever reason. Trey's is all excited about conquering the entire world with fighting, while she's suddenly wanting them to chill out and just love everyone. Maybe she went to Burning Man or something like that. Next, we see Commander Bask informing Jamatov and Delmail that they've successfully conquered the entire asteroid belt, and the Muse Zorbatos Empire is completely eradicated. Shapiro is dead, and Gildrome is retreated to a different dimension. Then we see Jude and those other thieves in our hangar being fed by us. We ask them to join our crew, and they do. But I literally never use them, so that's completely irrelevant. Also, apparently, the Oz forces have something in their control called MD that's allowing them to have their troops respawn or something like that. So, that's nice. Oh man, here we go. Time for mission 25. Jamatov is giving a speech about how Oz has completely conquered the space colonies and now they will make their move on the Earth itself. Trey's jumps in for some reason and says he stopped believing in the ideals of Oz, so he gets thrown in jail. It's really random. Some brand new guy named Subarov shows up, and he has some bad news for Oz. With Trey's being thrown in jail, he's being seen as a martyr of sorts, so many of the troops have begun to rebel, forming a new faction. Jamatov orders all people who don't follow orders to be shot, and commences Operation Nova, the invasion of Earth. Then we get transmission from a familiar ship. It's Alan, and he's talking about a base under attack by many MD troops. They're killing everything in sight, other than Oz troops. Quattro's currently holding them off, but he can't for long. They're trying to take out General Black, so time to go save him. When it gets to the battle view, there's a rather lengthy cutscene of sorts showing Quattro barely defending the base. Unfortunately, we were too late and General Blex is already dead. Regardless, we've got to stop this attack. A bunch more troops show up, including Jared and the obnoxious Rich. The battle's standard for the most part. There is one interesting thing if you have Selene attack Rich. It gives you a dialogue choice. Essentially, the top two tell him that she hates him, blah blah blah, but the third option says she'll keep fighting him as long as he's on the enemy side. He's kinda confused by what she means, but well then I had Selene obliterate him. This is important later. This mission was extremely easy. After the battle, everyone's just mourning the loss of General Blex and talking about how Oz is our number one enemy. We then see Relena talking with Pagan about meeting someone, and it seems like it's a controversial thing. She doesn't really elaborate on who or what the meeting is though. Well, that was nice and quick. On to mission 26. The main Oz army and the Trey's faction are fighting just outside the Sun Kingdom. Commander Basque orders to continue to attack them when the Trey's faction runs past the borders of it. Basque orders his troops to briefly stop firing to allow all of the Trey's faction to end up inside the Sun Kingdom. He wants to have a diplomatic reason to attack them inside. Relena calls Commander Basque and orders him to evacuate all of his troops from the Sun Kingdom as they do not allow fighting within their borders. Obviously, Basque is not going to do that, and he says those troops are fighting him, and they have the right to pursue them. Relena says she's keeping them within the Sun Kingdom as refugees, so they can't attack. And Basque just agrees for some reason. The Trey's faction of specials are freaking out, wondering what they can do. They're unable to fight, and they feel unwelcome in the Sun Kingdom so they decide to just blow themselves up. But then Marchwind shows up and tells them they will have protection from us within the border. Before we can react, the Mycenae and Hyaki clan shows up to cause some trouble, cause why wouldn't they? Commander Basque hit the jackpot here, as he now justifies his attack by saving humanity, killing the demons. But of course, he wants to kill the Trey's faction along the way. 
This is another one of those escort type missions. You gotta get the Trey's faction to safely escape to the green area. But I'm always down to blow some dudes up along the way, you know? After a few turns, some new troops show up. Marquise Janice is piloting a robot that looks just like the Mazinger Z. She tells us this is called Minerva X and it's the counterpart to Mazinger. They stole the blueprints from that lab that was attacked like 69 missions ago and now they've reverse engineered it. However, there's apparently some failsafe we can activate to make the bot come on our side. I brought Mazinger over to it and told it, hey, uh, don't hurt us, right? And it worked. Now I had that robot on my side, although I don't think I ever used it. Outside of that, this was just standard battle. I beat it easily. After the fight, we get a broadcast where Dale Mail is giving a speech. He's all like, oh my god, the Sunk Kingdom is a sham. Oz was peacefully over there and they attacked us. This gives us the right to dismantle the kingdom using any force necessary. Relena has no intentions of giving up the idea of total pacifism, so sounds like we gotta defend the place. Next, we see some guy named Banjo. Honestly, not sure if we've met him yet, cause it's way too hard to follow the story, but he was one of the heads of Karaba. He's thinking about working with the Trey's faction of Oz because it's clear Oz is enemy number one to our cause. Well, that was neat. Another quick mission. Let's go to mission 27. This one starts with Noeen meeting with Quatre at some unknown location. She really needs him to come defend the Sun Kingdom from Oz's attack. He agrees because he thinks defenseless people deserve a fair chance. Then we see Hero under attack by some Oz troops. He thinks he's done for when he hears a voice contacting him. It turns out to somehow be Trey's, and Hero comes on board his ship. After they get over hating each other, Trey's informs Hero that his destiny requires them to go to the Sunk Kingdom, and that he should prepare for a battle, you know, just in case. He gives him a new Gundam called the Epion. Meanwhile, back at the Sunk Kingdom, Oz has troops gathering in mass at the border. We get some message from an unknown person telling Takeru to wake up, and that his name is Mars. You know, Takeru, that guy from the Cosmo Crusher Squadron? Anyway, Takeru's freaking out like, who are you and what the heck are you talking about? Commander Basque issues a warning that the Sunk Kingdom must dissolve its government and hand over the leader, Relena Peacecraft. Naturally, we don't want to do that, so uh, I guess it's time for battle. Before the battle starts, Zek shows up out of nowhere and he's still got his mask off. Relena's wondering what's going on with him, and Noeen informs her that they're brother and sister. Oh my goodness, what a twist. This mission is pretty annoying because the enemies keep spawning, but it's only ever the basic ones. I think these are those MDs that can just regenerate themselves. It's actually impossible to win this battle. After like five sets of these things spawn or something like that, Relena comes and says how this goes against everything she believes in. So if it means losing the Sunk Kingdom to keep total pacifism, then so be it. And just like that, the Sunk Kingdom had fallen. After the battle, that Dorothy girl's talking with Relena, saying how she'll take her over to the Romefeller Foundation. Then she mentions something about her grandfather, and oh my god, I think Delmail is Relena's grandfather. All of Marchwind's feeling down about how maybe total peace can't be achieved if the Sunk Kingdom failed, and for some reason Zex and Hero are talking about their robots mind controlling them. And finally, we get a glimpse of a conversation with Jamatov and Subarov. They've detected some kind of unidentified fleet from one of the colony bases that doesn't match any known craft. If it's not Muse or Bados, nor Mycenaean, nor Hyaki, then who is it? Hang in there, y'all. We're, uh, kind of, almost, sort of there. It's time for Mission 28. It begins showing the Oz crew worrying about that incoming fleet. They sent out a reconnaissance mission to investigate, and they were all vaporized. The second reconnaissance fleet was killed as well, but now they've learned this new force is called the Galactic Imperial Army Advance Fleet. So they're definitely within the Earth sphere, so Oz is going on the defensive. Next, we see Delmail talking with Relena. He's wanting her to be a representative as one of the leaders of Oz, and she's like, what the heck, dude, you're crazy. But then he informs her of the new incoming threat and how all humans must be united so as to not repeat the mistakes when the Muse Zorbatos Empire invaded. Guess she's got a lot to think about. After that, we get more of that weird thing with Takeru. The person talking to him says his name is Emperor Zulu, and he's the leader of the Galactic Empire. Along with that, Takeru's actually an alien named Mars sent by Emperor Zulu to destroy the Earth. Takeru's like, screw you, buddy, and then he wakes up. Sounds like it was just a nightmare. Later, we learn that after defeating the Mycenae and Hyaki forces at the Sunk Kingdom, they retreated to band together for one final plan. 
They've constructed a massive mobile fortress, and they plan to take over everything with it. Guess Marchwind's gotta take care of this problem too, huh? Never anyone else around to help. The fight's very standard. We're fighting a bunch of the Mycenaean Kyaki dudes, like the 20th time we fought them now. After winning the fight, it was interesting because I couldn't make any upgrades. This was a two-part mission, and it's the first of its kind. Thankfully, I could save my game though. So now it's time for mission 29. We're inside the mobile fortress, and we've got to destroy it at all costs. We get a transmission from Murasame saying there are four energy generators inside. They haven't finished setting up the fences for them, so if we destroy all four, it'll destroy the fortress. I thought this one was really cool how the environment was completely inside. It was just a nice change of scenery, you know, 44 hours in. It turns out, when you destroy the generators, the fortress becomes unstable, so it was in my best interest to not destroy each one immediately. The first one was guarded by Dr. Gura. I got him down to one more hit to die and just moved on. Emperor Bly was guarding the second one, and I got him down as well. The Great General Demon was guarding the third, and Marquis Janus was guarding the final one. It was pretty standard after that. I just blew up all the leaders and the generators went with them. I was informed I only had 10 minutes to safely escape, which was extremely easy. I brought all my troops back to the starting area, and we were out of there. After the mission, there's this giant explosion, and we all escaped at the last second, even though I had a lot of time left. With the fortress blown up, we're sure we've seen the last of the Mycenae and Hyaki clan. No possible way they can recover after that. We then see Relena Peacecraft talking about how she accepted the position as a representative of Oz, and she wants to unite all nations to get rid of all conflict in the Earth sphere. Although it does seem like she has some kind of ulterior motive, or that she's not cool with actually being a part of this. Next, we catch up with Trey's and Lady Oon. They think Relena has joined Oz because she thinks she can achieve her total peace ideal by working with them, but they don't think it's feasible. They note that the Mycenae and Hyaki are finished and how Oz will have poor defenses in the space colonies due to the invasion of the Galactic Empire. Plus, they mention how they're working on some special ship called Libla. And finally, we meet someone brand new, Haman Khan. They're kind of disappointed that they won't be able to fight Oz at its full strength due to the Galactic Empire invasion, and it doesn't really elaborate any further. Oh my god, it's mission 30. What a milestone, wow. We drop in on Delmail and Jamatov and the Oz gang. They're clearly rattled by the Galactic Empire coming in at a time like this. Delmail's left to manage the Earth itself, while Jamatov and Subarov are managing space. It seems like Delmail's losing his touch a bit, and they don't like that he appointed Relena to a leadership position. Marchwind is very worried about the Galactic Empire because they remember what happened with the Muse Zorbatos Empire. Eiji gets an upgraded mech from someone named Elizabeth, which sure, I'll take that. Finally, Takeru gets another weird event with people calling him Mars. He's wondering why he knows the name of the Galactic Empire's leader, Zulu. Some unknown person is taunting Takeru, calling him a traitor, and telling him to try to stop him. Takeru runs off, and we chase him, beginning the mission. In the battle view, we see that unknown person is someone named Baron. She says how she's been ordered by Emperor Zulu to kill Mars because he's a traitor to the Galactic Empire. Takeru's so confused, then his robot appears. Someone named Geyer is telling him to transform, then his robot changes into this giant, crazy thing. Baron's thinking it's some kind of illusion, so she attacks him. Takeru annihilates her with this big sword thing. Apparently this is called the Five Gods Robot. The battle is against Oz. Some new guy named Yazan is trying to pick a fight. He's complaining that we're not joining him during an alien invasion, but like, you could just join us, you know? It goes both ways. Oh, and Rich shows up randomly and says, Hey, Selene, whatever happens out here, I'm in love with you. And she's just like, uh, yeah, whatever, dude. After a few turns, a bunch of allied units appear. These guys are the Con Battler 5, someone Bonjo brought in. We've got five people new to our crew now, Lioma, Chizuru, Juso, Kosuke, and a second person named Daisaku. But uh, as you might guess, I never use these people. This battle is where something insane happens. Based on the choice I said to Rich a few missions ago, I can talk with him and ask him to join Marchwin. He's like, oh my god, Celine, this means you're in love with me. And she's like, no dude, you're freaking gross. But you are a good fighter, and I think you could help our cause. He agrees that if he survives this battle, which he does based on that earlier decision. Other than that, this battle's real easy and real standard. 
After the fight, we're all like, hey, what's going on, Takeru? How'd you pilot that strange ship? Are you an alien spy? He's like, dude, I don't know what's happening either. I had this weird dream where someone kept calling me Mars, but I know I'm a human from Earth. Yeah, this dude's acting kinda sus. You know, like in that popular video game, Among Us. Next, we receive a call from Trey's Kush Renata. We're super sketched out by him because he wanted us to join Oz before, but he assures us that it's all behind him. He wants us to join him in taking on both Oz and the invading Galactic Empire. None of us are really sure what to do, so we tell him we'll sit on it. After that, we meet someone new. His name is Wall, and he's a higher up in the Galactic Empire. He's talking with Emperor Zulu about how their army is defeating Oz on all fronts in space. Then we see some dude named Mark who's worried about Mars and how the Earth is being invaded. Wall detects that he's acting as a spy and chases him. Emperor Zulu says he's aware that this guy's Mars' brother, and he'd love to let him meet him by having him kill Mars in battle. Oh my god, this game's still going. Are we even close? Time for mission 31. Captain Bright's talking about how we're at another decision that needs to be made. We obviously want to fight against Oz and the Galactic Empire, so we can either join up with the Trey's faction or fight on our own. It's hard to decide, so we want to go out and get some time to think about it. And what better way to do that than go to Lake Victoria and capture the space launch site Oz has? After that, we meet some new guy named Dangle. I think he's a warlord from the Galactic Empire, and he's here to kill Mars. Near him are two new people named Hikaru and Daisuke. Daisuke says he recognizes him as from the Galactic Imperial Army, and they destroyed his home planet when he was younger. He decides that he has no choice but to fight them. The fight itself is against Oz, and it's just like all the others. After a few turns, the Dan Kugas crew shows back up. Domon also shows up with Rain, and he says he's got a new Gundam called the God Gundam. After I've defeated the final Oz troops, a lot more ships spawned in, and they all look new. This was the Galactic Empire crew, this time headed by Dangle. But someone else shows up to back us up. This guy is Duke, and uh, all he says is he's here to kill the Galactic Empire. I'll take it. None of them gave me any trouble, really. The fights were becoming very repetitive at this point. After finishing them all off, the rest of the G Gundam crew showed up. Almost had my entire team back at this point. After the battle, Daisuke, Duke, and Hikaru are telling us how they're all from a planet called Freed. They have strived to defeat the Galactic Imperial Army ever since they destroyed their own home planet. Since our motives are the same, they decide to join us. We then learn that Domon and the others successfully defeated the Devil Gundam, and that's why they came back to us. Although it only happened due to Schwartz sacrificing himself. Next, we meet some girl named Maria. Apparently she's King Freed's daughter, and Daisuke is her big brother. Oh my god, how is this still getting more convoluted? I can't follow this. By far, the highlight of this post-mission dialogue is Rich joining our team. Celine's like, oh my god, I wasn't being serious, please go away. But Rich is like, nah, we can be together forever now, baby. And now Rich is officially part of Marchwind. It's funny, because if he's near Celine in battle, he gets that unrequited love bonus, <laughs> because she doesn't love him back. Finally, I had to decide whether or not to join the Trey's faction before launching into space. Totally because I wanted to, and not because the text was transcribed for this branch, I decided to stay as our own force and not join Trey's. He's just so sketchy, you know? Mission 32 time, you know the drill. We're now officially in space. Our first order of business is to establish a base for ourselves. Alan suggests we find some big ship called the Ravian Rose. Apparently it was rumored to be destroyed, but that was all a cover-up. Then we cut to Takeru, who's having another one of those crazy dreams where someone's reaching out to him and calling him Mars. Takeru's like, oh my god, shut up, I'm tired of this crap. Next, Kignan talks about how there's some aircraft approaching the Earth's sphere called Guadon, and that Haman Khan is definitely on board. Quattro seems to get weird when this is mentioned, and he starts saying how he was part of the Axis during the war before the Musorbatus Empire invaded. He seems to kind of play it off, and he says he's not sure if they'll be an ally or an enemy to us. Next thing we know, we're under attack by the Galactic Empire. Time for battle. When it goes into the battle view, we meet this new alien who's reminding Marg how there's a bomb attached to his craft, and it will only be removed if he kills Mars. Marg calls out to Mars and baits him to come out, and Marg informs him that they're twin brothers. So the battles are all in space from here on out. 
it can be kind of annoying because the asteroids littered throughout the map greatly impede your movement. But other than that, they behave the exact same, it just looks different. Marg spends the entire battle attacking Mars, so you can just keep a healer next to him. But you have to not kill Marg, or it's game over. Oh yeah, Amuro was absolutely overpowered by this point. I had his stats upgraded enough, and he unlocked an ability that tripled his damage in one turn. It, uh, hurts pretty bad. After killing all the troops, Marg was freed from the bomb, and escaped safely. Unlucky for us, a ton of new Galactic Empire troops showed up led by a girl named Rose. I killed them all with ease, and that was the end of that. After the battle, Marg's talking with Mars about how their parents were killed by the Galactic Empire. Their father was doing anti-proton research, and Emperor Zulu stole his plans to develop an anti-proton bomb. It was implanted on a ship called Geyer that is controlled by Mars. Emperor Zulu was going to use Mars to destroy the Earth. Marg then gives him a pendant that will allow him to transform into the Five Gods robot anytime he wishes. Next, we finally arrive at the Ravian Rose. Amuro meets some girl named Chain, and she's totally fangirling over him. She's like, I've wanted to meet you all my life, and I would love to be the one who designed your robot. Belchaka comes up and like, hey, back off, I'm his girlfriend. They start arguing, and Amuro's like, yeah, I'm just gonna, you know, leave. After that, we jump over to Jamatov. He's at the moon base, and they're being completely overrun by the Trey's faction, who now call themselves White Fang. They threaten him, but he escapes in some craft. They decide to just blow up the entire base, which I guess works somehow? We learn from Commander Basque that Jamatov was apparently killed during the invasion. Mission 33. I'm starting to lose hope that this will ever end. We begin with Delmail acting as a frontline general in space. White Fang issues an all-out attack on his base, and he and the base are destroyed immediately. Relena learns that Delmail was attacked, and Dorothy's all sad that she lost her grandfather. We then see Kearns talking with Zex, asking him to come to space with White Fang along with his Gundam. Zex is like, that's not my name anymore. It's Miliardo Peacecraft, and I'm not interested. But then he realizes the fate of the human race is at stake, so he changes his mind and decides to come along. Then there's an explosion on the Ravian Rose, and Marg is nowhere to be seen. It's time to fight. In the battle view, we see Emperor Zulu arguing with Mars. We go to fight, then a ton of Galactic Empire troops spawn to make this take a lot longer than it needs to. Emperor Zulu had 45,000 HP, and he hits like a truck. When I finally did kill him, he just respawns and says we only killed an image of him. And of course, in typical Super Robot Wars fashion, a ton of new troops spawn in. These are all from White Fang. Kearns asked us one last time to join them, but we refuse, so now they treat us as hostile forces. Once I killed all those dudes, even more Galactic Empire troops appeared. Thankfully, I didn't have to actually fight these. A bunch of new yellow troops appeared. These are the Axis, led by Haman Khan. She tells us to leave things to them, so we decide to get the heck out of there. After the battle, Haman Khan comes on board our ship to speak with us directly. We both realize we have a common goal in defeating the Galactic Imperial Army, so Haman poses working together. She even says she knows one of us really well, and refers to Quattro as Char, just like Amuro did earlier. Quattro blurts out that he never betrayed her in the past for some reason. Apparently, we're not too keen on joining them because they want to restore Zeon. Uh, whatever that is. I think it's something from before the Musa Sorbatos Empire invaded. Next, we learn about how the main base of Oz was hit by an all-out attack from White Fang. Both Jamatov and Commander Basque were killed in action. Kearns is giving a big old speech about the success of White Fang and introduces their new leader, Miliardo Peacecraft. He declares all people on Earth as enemies, and only the space colonies are allowed to survive. Relena can't believe her brother's doing this, and Trace asks her to step down. Finally, Marg has somehow gotten himself captured by Rose. She's erased his memory or something like that, and has him convinced that his only purpose is to kill Mars. So I guess we gotta deal with that soon. Mission 34. Please, send help. <laughs> this mission brings back the coolest looking character, Howard. I guess he doesn't like Zex, so he brings Duo and Hero back to join us. Thank God, Hero is awesome. They acknowledge the threat of the Galactic Empire, but Zex is an imminent threat to humanity. He wants everyone to die. Then it goes back to Trey's and Relena. Trey's formally relieves her of her position in the Romefeller Foundation, but he does let her go safely. We meet a new alien named Gondar. 
He's raging that Marchwind keeps interfering in the Galactic Empire's plans, especially with Mars. Then we see that Dorothy has come to be with Zex. She says she used to hang out with him and Trey's when they were all kids. She just wants to watch him fight, and he's like, uh, sure, why not? She's the weirdest character in this game, I swear. Anyway, now it's time to battle. The battle's against White Fang, which is very similar to Fighting Oz. It's pretty chill at first. After killing most of the enemies, Zex spawns in to take care of us himself. The most annoying mechanic ever is back in this mission, and that Zex can just avoid attacks for no reason. The same thing it did when I fought Lekane. I think it happens five times or so before you can actually hit him. Other than hitting Zex, the mission's real easy. After the battle, we're arguing with Captain Bright because he wants us to retreat, but we think we can finish Zex off. Bright wins the fight though, as the Galactic Empire's right on our doorstep, and we gotta deal with them immediately. And now, here we go. Time for mission 35. This is another one of those two-part missions, so it just jumps right into the battle. We're fighting against Dangle, Gondar, and Rose of the Galactic Imperial Army. Oh yeah, and Marg is here saying he doesn't have a brother, and Mars needs to die. One unique thing with this mission is there's a big satellite we're trying to protect. If it dies, the mission is over. It's not exactly tanky either, but yeah, outside of that, this isn't any different than any other mission. I beat it first try. After the battle, we see Emperor Zulu talking with Wall. He's saying that if all his commanders are struggling this much, the Earth must truly be dangerous. He decides he'd better go in and take care of things himself. Meanwhile, apparently Relena has decided to travel to space to convince Sex to stop all this fighting nonsense. I'm sure he's gonna listen. And after that, there's quite a strange turn of events. Since Delmail and Jamatov have both died, Oz is requesting Trays to come back to them and lead things. For whatever reason, he accepts. Maybe the threat of aliens killing them all helped a bit. It's time for mission 36. They told me I can't leave the writing room until I'm done. We see that Dorothy is in space with Relena now. Also, somehow Relena's hair got really long again, which just, it makes no sense. She's up there trying to convince Zex to stop all the fighting, and uh, yeah, that didn't work at all. But he lets her hang out on the ship with him. Meanwhile, Belchaka and Chain are arguing over Amuro again. He was supposed to go shopping with Belchaka, but Chain argues that she built him a new mech called the New Gundam. Amuro decides to hang around with Chain to check out this new robot, and oh man, Belchaka is livid. This is more drama than one of those TLC shows. And then it's on to the battlefield. Camille and Sho are out negotiating with Haman Khan, so they can't be used in this battle. Of course, we're fighting the Galactic Imperial Army again. There's not really anything special in this fight. The main thing is Marg dies, and the plotline of him killing his brother is closed. After the battle, Takeru is all sad that his brother's dead, but he has to carry on and defeat Emperor Zulu at all costs. Camille and Sho have also returned from talking with Haman Khan. They say the Axis has no plans to reach out to us as an enemy nor as a friend at this time. But they are assured they're planning to eliminate the Galactic Imperial Army. We're not really sure if we can trust them, but at least they seem to have similar motivations to us. Next, we learn that the Galactic Empire has invaded the Earth sphere with the biggest force yet. They're using warp technology to appear in mass. The force is supposedly bigger than all the forces in the Earth sphere combined. Well, good thing I have plot armor, right? Now it's mission 37. Hang in there, y'all. Wall is talking with someone new named Janella. She's another higher up in the Galactic Imperial Army. They're saying how the anti-proton bombs are impossible to use, so they'll have to invade the Earth more traditionally. Janella mentions something that happened 40,000 years ago that could affect the invasion, but she doesn't elaborate on it. After that, we receive an urgent call from Dr. Hazuki. He says someone's infiltrated the Beast Fighter base, and we need to come assist immediately. Since the Galactic Empire is invading the Earth anyway, we figure, eh, may as well go check it out. When it cuts to the battle view, we see our old friends Ivan and Albert. They're the ones snooping around the base. I guess they're looking for some HQ for their crew that they're calling the BF Group. They also mention something about how their boss is working with the invading aliens. Some troops show up asking them what they're up to, and Albert whacks them with a crazy spinning move. The base is being surrounded by troops, and General Igor is freaking out that Marchwind didn't arrive in time. He mentions some last resort thing about a flying dragon. They have to do some emergency launch password to do it. Marchwind arrives just after, so our goal is to keep the enemy away from the dragon. This battle brought a huge new asset to my team. Amuro could attack twice per turn with his new mech. 
being able to do that is just insane for putting out DPS, and he was one of my strongest attackers already. Once the dragon thing is 90% charged up, Albert will attack the base himself. There's an explosion and everyone freaks out. General Igor is trying his best to stop him, but he's no match. But then, in an insane twist, Schwartz shows up to save him. Guess he didn't die fighting the Devil Gundam after all. Finally, General Igor decides he has no other choice, so he sacrifices himself to protect the dragon. I literally have no idea what he did or why, but somehow it prevented Albert from destroying it. Finally, after defending the base long enough, the dragon spawns in the lake. Dr. Hazuki demands everyone leave, so we do. With tons of Galactic Empire troops surrounding him, he issues a gigantic explosion attack, wiping them all off the face of the Earth. After the battle, Domon's asking Schwartz why and how he's alive. Schwartz is like, that's not important. The Devil Gundam's about to arise once again. We get a bit suspicious, saying Schwartz is always around when the Devil Gundam comes back, but he assures us he's on our side. I guess we should trust him, why not? Meanwhile, Quatre's talking about some horrible monster resembling a lion attacking all the people on Earth. He's sure it's related to the alien invasion, and it needs to be stopped. To make things even more crazy, Trey's contacts us once again. He says we should work with him because the invading aliens, yada yada, you know. Look dude, don't you get it? We don't like you. Go away. Either way, I had to make a decision. I can either go with Domon and the others to fight the Devil Gundam, go with Quatre and the others to defeat the Lion Monster, or just stay with the main troops. I decided to not go off on any of those side missions because my god, can this game just end already? Mission 38. I'm beginning to see the light. Maybe I'll be free from this nightmare. Randomly at the start, Chain is showing Amuro some robot parts, and she asks him to go out for some tea with her. She promises she won't let Belchaka have him, and he accepts. We move to Europe and Director Nakaho is there and mistakes us for the enemy. Thankfully he recognizes who we are because he was warning he might have to use his special power. They're saying it's got a big bang punch and it can only be used once. We're just talking about how Trey's is leading an all out defensive but it doesn't seem like it's going to be enough. That's when Julia says that the humans have a secret weapon they can use against the Galactic Empire, the Mark of Grados. Since she learned that Terrans and Gradosians were created from the same root in evolution, she learned about this mark. The pre-human and Gradosians discovered Earth 40,000 years ago and realized this was the end of their species. They wanted to create a safety mechanism for the creatures left on the Earth to be able to survive in the future. This mark will prevent any species other than Gradosians or Earthlings from entering the Earth sphere. Essentially, it would cut off the Galactic Imperial Army's teleportation they're using. Julia tells us the mark is located in Cusco, so that's where we're going next. Meanwhile, we drop in on Emperor Zulu. He's talking with Wall about the human troops amassing in a single location. He seems worried about the mark of Grados, but Wall assures him we probably don't even know it exists. Still, Emperor Zulu acknowledges he screwed up with the whole Mars thing, so he wants to be cautious. He's sending tons of troops to Cusco. In the battle view, this mission requires us to break through the enemies to where we believe the mark is. But of course, I'm gonna kill everyone along the way so that I get some cash. So yeah, I just blew everyone up, it was easy. That was the end of that. This is another two part mission, so now it's on to mission 39. No lore before the battle, and it's just another standard fight against the Galactic Empire. I was supposed to break through to a green area again, but yeah, I just blew everyone up instead. Easy game. There's no lore after that battle either, so it's immediately on to mission 40. Depending whether or not you beat the previous two missions within 10 turns, you take a separate path here. I took way more than 10 because I just killed everyone. The mission starts with someone I hated seeing again, Avi Lu. They're talking with two unknown people about something strange, how the Muse Zorbatos Empire and Emperor Zulu were to be chosen as candidates, but humans are shaking things up. They're all saying something about how they are the will of the galaxy, and I don't know, it's just confusing. So then we receive a call from Trey's, who says that despite Oz's best efforts, Cusco has been overrun by the Galactic Empire. We're all freaking out about how this is the end, but come on, we're the main characters in this game. We gotta go fight anyway. So Trey's offers to give Oz's full support to help us out. Then we get a message from Haman Khan saying, Oh, looks like you're going to try to activate the Mark of Grados. We promise not to send any Axis troops to attack you until you're done. Uh, gee, thanks, I guess? In the battle view, it shows a green zone over the ruins of Cusco. I believe you have to just reach that area to win, but you know how I am. 
just blowing everyone up and all that. Hero had a massive double beam attack now, and it's just awesome. These save so much time due to not having to watch the battle animation every single attack. After I killed the last robot, it was done. There's no lore after the mission, as this is another two-parter. So on to mission 41. A.G. has Julia in his aircraft, and he has to bring her to the location of the mark. But we also can't let the enemy get there first to destroy it. It was nice being in a new environment for this one, with the inside of a temple and all. It just feels good to have a change of pace, you know? The mission was really easy. I mean, honestly, I was pretty overpowered by this point, so none of the missions were giving any trouble. I brought A.G. to the mark, and a huge reaction went off. After the battle, Albert's freaking out that this happened, and he says his BF group may have been able to stop it. But Kong Ming says this is actually perfect for the BF group's plans, and it's the will of the big fire. Whatever that means. Wall and Janella are confused because the mark was activated, but none of their troops suffered at all. They still don't seem to know what it actually did, but they are concerned since Emperor Zulu wanted it destroyed so bad. They head back to space to regroup for the time being. Julia says that while the mark has been activated and it should stop the Galactic Empire, it's not without side effects. Now no one can leave the Earth Sphere if they're here either. This includes all the people who were sent here from the Bison Well. There's also a huge distortion in the sky now. It's like the universe is warped. Because of this, a lot of experiments scientists have been running are going strange, including the Getter Robo. It's time for Mission 42. I don't think I can take this anymore. With the Mark of Grados deployed, the Galactic Empire has been retreating into space. Trace is taking Oz into space, but it doesn't seem like he's going after them. Instead, we think he's going up there to take on Zex, which just seems like a disaster of an idea for humanity. Meanwhile, Emperor Zulu is confirming to his generals that they can no longer return home, but now the Earth is their new home. They say this is lowering morale among the troops like crazy, but he says he'll just kill anyone who doesn't follow his orders. Yeah, that seems like a good idea. We decide to go back into space to figure out what's going on with Trays and Zex. We discover a destroyed space colony, and Troa is in the wreckage of it. It seems he was working with Zex, but he seems like he has amnesia. We decide to let him come back with us. Next, Hero went off on his own to Zex's aircraft to have Relena taken away. He gets there, but she wants to try to convince Zex to stop fighting one last time. He's like, yeah, that's not happening, because Trays is coming here with all his troops. So, looks like there's about to be a massive fight around here. Hero promises to protect Relena at all costs. When it goes into the battle view, both White Fang and Oz spawn in as red and yellow entities. Trey's formally challenges Zex to a duel, as he believes White Fang is threatening humanity's existence. Zex declines his offer and instead decides to blast him with a giant beam. Lady Oon appears at the last second and knocks Trey's out of the way. Then the battle begins. While we acknowledge Oz is a threat, White Fang is by far the biggest threat, so we are to focus on them. They're the red ones. Dorothy decides that since we appeared, she's going to fight against us with her squad too. I didn't even know she knew how to fight. After a couple of turns, a lot more Oz troops spawn in. It's Jared and the gang, and they want to kill March Wind. So much for only focusing on White Fang guys, huh? Even further into the battle, Zex decides that the Earth needs to be destroyed, so he points all of his ship's weapons at it. We're freaking out, and Howard appears and blows himself up directly next to him. Uh, guess Howard's dead now. Zex and Hero appear in their Gundams just outside the ship, so that's not the end of Zex quite yet. And of course, when I went to attack him, he did that thing where he just disappears over and over. I think it's really frustrating how they make the boss enemies do that in this game. Of course, he's able to counterattack and kill me in one shot. It's totally fair. Towards the end of the fight, a red Gundam appears next to Trey's. It turns out this is Wu Fei, and he really dislikes Trey's for the whole messing everything up, you know? They fight and Wu Fei wins. We try to get Wu Fei to join us, but he just runs away and says he hates us, or something like that. Finally, after both Oz and White Fang are done for, it's over. Or so I thought. Even more enemies spawn in, and this time it's Haman Khan and the Axis forces. She thanks us for taking care of those other guys, but now she declares Axis as the leaders of the Galactic Empire and the entire Earth Sphere. Oh my god, give me a break, come on. She and Quattro have some weird exchange, and then she calls him Char again. Oh yeah, in this battle I got to see what Domon's new Gundam could do. And man, it has an insane AoE attack. It just obliterates everyone. Thankfully, I didn't need to kill the entire Axis army, as Haman Khan retreated after a bunch of people died. 
Finally, that mission was over so long. After the battle, there's a low feeling among Marchwind. Sure, we won the battle, but it feels bad knowing Axis is just becoming another thing we have to deal with. Along with that, Quattro randomly disappeared. No one even knows if he's dead or alive. Bonjo seems to think Quattro isn't going to come back. That really sucks because I had his robot upgraded to max stats. Then we see Lady Oon on our ship. She's basically saying that White Fang is no more, but Oz isn't really a force anymore either with Trey's gone. She tries to get Relena to shoot her since they ruined her perfect pacifism dream, but Relena reminds her that there's still a bunch of refugees on the moon. So Lady Oon, Relena, and Julia all go there to try to save what little remains of Oz to help march wind against the Galactic Empire and now the Axis. Alright, we're finally at the end! Woo! -hoo! Nah, I'm just kidding. Time for mission 43. Think we're close to the end yet, though? I don't know. Basically, now we're saying how White Fang is no more and Oz isn't a threat at all. The Galactic Empire is still out there, but they've stayed silent for quite some time. This leaves just Axis as our main threat, and they're already invading the Earth sphere with a massive space fortress. It seems Haman Khan planned to sit back and watch while we all fought each other, then come in to take the spoils. We contact Lady Oon on the moon and she tells us the Axis forces are even larger than Oz and White Fang combined. Because of course they are. She also says Oz found a deserter from the Galactic Empire and he told them Emperor Zulu himself is in the Earth Sphere. This causes all of us to collectively freak out because he's supposed to be super OP. We acknowledge the threat of the Axis is real but the Galactic Empire is still our main priority. So we decide to go in and fight Emperor Zulu himself. We go into the battle view and it's against the Galactic Empire, as you probably expect. Emperor Zulu's there too, and he's bragging about how he's the supreme leader of the universe, and we should all bow to him. Nah, I think I'll blow you up instead. Killing all of his troops was surprisingly easy. When I got to Emperor Zulu himself, he did have over 30,000 HP, but I took him down with ease. But then he respawned in a different ship with 45,000 HP immediately after. So I did what I do best and blasted him again. But again, he just respawns and laughs at us. He says we're merely destroying a shadow of his true self once again. He says he's going to take Mars and detonate the anti-proton bomb, and then he runs off. Meanwhile, we've of course got another problem on our hands. The Axis spawns in, and they're looking for a fight. Haman Khan herself isn't here, but these dudes named Grammy, Marshmar, and Pampa show up. They say they recommend our unconditional surrender, so we just laugh in their faces and, oh god, time to fight. Yeah, they were real easy to kill. I don't think I lost any of my team in this entire mission. Another one down. So now Haman Khan calls us and suggests we work together. What in the world? She says it's pointless to fight with the threat of the Galactic Empire looming, so we should team up to take them out. Afterwards, we can battle each other to decide who will rule the Earth Sphere once and for all. Um, yeah, but you attacked us, so, uh, eh. Oh well, Captain Bright accepts the offer. The team doesn't really like the idea of working with them at all, but it seems it's a necessary evil. Hey, that wasn't so bad, right? Now on to mission 44. Haman Khan's plan is to attack the Galactic Empire in a bunch of small skirmishes. Their troops will get in disarray, which will allow us access to the true location of Emperor Zulu. It seems crazy, but it's the best we've got. After that, we see Haman Khan talking to some dude named Gato. She's talking him up like he's some kind of famous warlord. Apparently, he was on the moon when Oz first invaded and barely escaped. She offers him some fancy new Gundam to use in the battle. Then Haman is talking to Grammy about something they have called a Psycho Gundam. Apparently, only new types can use it, which she believes Grammy is. I think it's something people like to keep secret or something like that because Grammy tries to pretend it's not true. But I guess an army of new types is being formed within the Axis now as well. We pull in closer to where we believe Emperor Zulu is when we get a transmission from Axis. It's Marshmar, and he says Haman Khan wants his troops to land on our ship to accompany us for the mission. We're pretty annoyed because it feels like we're being spied on, but well, nothing we can really do about it. They're like, don't worry, we won't fight you. At least not until Emperor Zulu's taken down, you know? In the battle view, we're fighting in space again. After the first turn, a ton of the new Galactic Empire troops spawn. And one of them is Wu Fei. What the heck is he doing there? He's saying how we're evil and Emperor Zulu is the true righteous one. He's gonna kill us to protect him. Yeah, this dude's definitely lost it. I actually had to fight against Wu Fei in this one. It felt kinda weird. 
he has that annoying ability where he just disappears. I'm not sure if it's possible to do that with my characters. It never happened in my playthrough, but maybe there's a way to learn that ability. Essentially, all the big shots in the Galactic Empire are here. And I mean all of them. Even Gondar and Wachamids appear. They all have quite a lot of health, so endurance can be a big factor. Anyway, it took about an hour and a half to kill them all. I had to kill Emperor Zulu three total times to get him to finally go away. He says that he can't die. Even if his body is destroyed, his cells will spread across the universe, and they'll eventually find each other, and he'll rule once again. Yeah, dude, I think you're done. After the battle, the only thing that happens is a bunch of random troops from the Galactic Empire come to our ship and surrender. They say they were afraid of Emperor Zulu and they were forced to fight. So we take them in, and maybe we're done with these guys once and for all. Well, I think you know, we're not done yet. Mission 45. With the Galactic Empire defeated, Haman Khan wastes no time coming to us with a proposal. She says either we fight now, or we can join the Axis and have half the Earth sphere. Naturally, we're not cool with that, so yeah, we say no. Haman says we're weak for taking those troops in and kills them. Well, guess she's gonna have to die just like Emperor Zulu. When we get into the battle, we see Marshmar took no time to immediately switch back to the other side, along with his girl Kara. For the most part, this battle didn't have anything too crazy. Haman Khan herself is fighting against us, and of course, she does the thing where she dodges all my attacks. I have no idea if there's a way to counter this. It usually takes like five tries before they just start taking damage. I took her down with relative ease, and she fled the area. It almost felt too easy. And, well, it was. A new ship spawns in, and it's someone named Jay Lin. She says she's shocked that Emperor Zulu was defeated and that Avi Lu may be right and that we're worth investigating. We're just like, what the heck are you talking about? And she says she's part of the Ali Kisu. They are the will of the galaxy and embodiment of that will. Then she decides to fight us. So this is another mega boss fight, just like Avi Lu from like five hours ago in this video. Unlike last time, I knew what to expect going in. She does the same thing of not moving and using a crazy attack with long range. So I took my mothership to be the only thing in her range and set my healers next to it. Once again, this allowed me to completely drain Jalen's energy, which makes the fight much, much easier. After it was drained, I brought a Muro in to do a triple damage boosted attack. 27,000, holy crap. She almost died right away. I figured, hey, this is gonna be easy. But uh, then she said we're more powerful than she thought and fully healed herself in one turn. Wow, dude. Luckily, I had enough damage to bring her down once again without the triple boost. So glad I beat this one first try, because I would have had to do the earlier fights all over again. After the battle, we're all wondering what Jay Lin meant by the Ali Kisu. Suddenly, Daisuke says he remembers hearing about it when he was younger. Long before the planets of Freed, Gizan, and Grados existed, there was an ancient civilization known as the Aliki, the ones who protect the galaxy. Although, it was just an urban legend to him. We then meet up with Emma Lee, who, uh, I don't know, who is she? She says she's heard that Oz is joining up with the Axis to create peace on the ground. Like, sure, that'll stop some fighting, but the Axis is bad news. Haman Khan is not a nice person, you know? And finally, we have Wufei waking up. He's freaking out, wondering where he is, and we're like, Hey dude, we rescued you. It seems he was being brainwashed, because now he immediately says Emperor Zulu is the evil force that needs to be defeated. So, he's back on our side again. Ugh, I gotta keep going. Mission 46. Haman Khan and the Axis are experiencing a lot of civil unrest due to the citizens of the Earth Sphere not wanting to cooperate with their government. She demands all people of the former Romefeller Foundation be eliminated, along with Julia and Relena Peacecraft. She assigns Grammy with control of the Earth. After that, Grammy is talking with Lakin, another higher up in the Axis. He's saying how Haman is leading them down a bad path, and he essentially hints that if he were to break off with his own faction, they could surely overthrow Haman Khan as leader. You know, hypothetically. Lakin agrees with this, and it looks like we got some infighting. In the battle view now, we're going against all of the Axis. Well, not quite all of them. A girl named Pull spawns in as a yellow faction, and she's in that Psycho Gundam that Grimmy was given. Haman recognizes there must be a mutiny going on, so she leaves the battle. The fight itself's very standard. No special lore happened or anything like that. It was easy. After the battle, we're all just frustrated how it seems like history keeps repeating itself. The humans band together to save themselves from some intergalactic threat, and then when there is no threat anymore, the humans start fighting each other. 
Same thing happening with the Axis now. Ugh, I think the end is in sight. At least I hope. Time for Mission 47. Grammy's giving a big speech about how Haman Khan is the root of all evil and that he's going to bring her head to unite the Earth's sphere. Uh, geez, that's kind of gross. But then we see the other side with Marshmar and Kara saying that Grammy's a traitor and they must stop him at all costs. This is going to get juicy. We decide we're going to take advantage of the situation by going after Grammy's faction, then go after Haman Khan's next. When we get into the battle view, the two Axis factions are arguing, then Grammy decides he doesn't want to be here and leaves. What the heck, man? Even worse, Haman Khan's like, well, if Grimmy isn't here, I'm leaving too. Ugh, guess we're just fighting the unimportant people. Another time waster mission. You just have to attack the red troops, which are Grimmies. The yellow ones that are Haman Khan's will all help you. It's extremely easy, and when you're done, a bunch of new troops spawn. Marshmar and Kara say they'll hold off the rest of Grimmie's troops while we enter the main Axis ship to go kill Grimmie. So, uh, that was a fast mission. On to mission 48. Grimmie's annoyed that we got to his location before Haman did, but he says he'll kill us all the same. Yeah, right, buddy. This is another mission that takes place inside a big building, which was a nice change of pace. Essentially, you just make your way through this ship, fighting way too many regular troops that stand no chance along the way. I was getting kind of tired of the fighting because it just started to feel like busy work. Only the main people were tough, like Grimmy, who did that annoying thing where he just disappears in a puff of smoke. After killing him, I was done with another mission. We're cruising now. After the battle, we decide that even though we're very tired from all the fighting, we have to fight Haman Khan immediately. Her forces are weak from fighting Grimmy, and she can rebuild faster than we can. This is our only chance. Selene's randomly feeling bloodthirsty, saying she was going to rip Haman Khan's throat. <laughs> oh my god. Just let this game end. So, uh, yeah, mission 49. Woo! There's literally no lore before the fight, and, well, the fight is just against the Axis, like we've done like 10 times now. Haman Khan, yeah, you guessed it. She dodges your attacks in a puff of smoke. I know, I know, real original. This fight was easy as well, and now we're finally done. No aliens, no Oz, no Axis, nothing to fear. Finally, we can have peace on Earth. Well, like any good anime, when one villain's defeated, there's gotta be someone new to take their place, because peace would be boring. The scientists with us say they caught something very concerning on surveillance, but they'll wait till we've had a bit of rest to tell us about it. Mission 50. Did you think there were this many? So we've officially received the bad news about this new enemy. In an insane twist, the Muse Zorbatos Empire is returned. They shouldn't be able to be here because of the Mark of Grottos, but well, here they are. We're wondering how they made it to the Earth Sphere. We need to solve this problem from the source. The scientists believe it's from some alternate dimension, but no more time to think because they're here to fight right now. The enemies in this mission are extremely weak. I guess that's what happens when you bring back dudes from like 40 missions ago. That guy Gildrome is back and he does that same attack that lowers everybody's stats. I think he like messes with our brains or something like that. Either way, it was easy to kill them all. After the battle, we're just devastated that the Muse Zorbatus Empire can just return like that. We don't have the technology to make something as powerful as the Mark of Grottos, so there's no real way to stop them from coming here. However, the scientists have found a way to travel to their universe, so we can kick their butts there. I guess it's time for us to be the aggressors. Apparently, there's just one piece missing to be able to travel there, so we look through Gildrome's ruined ship to see if anything there could let us travel between dimensions. They find this thing called a Gondor Cannon on his ship, and Dr. Hazuki believes it can be modified to give us the energy to travel to their dimension. However, it comes with a cost. It's not guaranteed that whoever goes to that dimension will be able to return to this one. With a few months time, they could make something to guarantee we get back, but, well, we don't have that kind of time. We want to fight right now. So we've got to decide who's going into the Muse universe, which is probably a death wish. The Dan Kuga crew all want to go, along with Hero, Troa, Duo, and Wufei. Even Captain Bright's going to go. But now there's no leader to stay in Earth to keep things in order. We elect Amuro to stay and run things with Marchwind. I had to choose whether I wanted to go to the Muse universe or stay here. And well, Amuro's my best fighter along with Selene, so I definitely stayed in the Earth sphere. They all leave and we stay here to make sure nothing bad happens. Okay, I'm being serious. We're close to the end. I swear. It's time for mission 51. 
Unfortunately, staying on Earth didn't keep us safe from any craziness. Ro comes to tell us she heard one of the space colonies was taken over on the news. The person who ran the operation was none other than Char Asnabel, or as we might know him, Captain Quattro. He's commanding something called the Neo Zeon Fleet, and I guess this is what the history he had with Paman Khan was. Something they were a part of in the war before the Muse Zorbatos Empire first showed up. Amuro thinks he waited to do this attack until he knew Marchwind had lost half its members. We all feel conflicted, but Amuro assures us that whether it's Quattro or Char, he's gonna try to kill us, so we've gotta kill him first. When we get into the battle view, we see these two people with Char named Goonie and Rezin. I guess they're some of his fellow evil people, you know? Both of my healers were in this battle, which was awesome. It means if I went to the Muse universe, I wouldn't have had any healing. That would have been miserable. But at the same time, I didn't have two of my strongest fighters, Hero and Eiji. Apparently, Char has sent this giant satellite asteroid thing called the Fifth to plummet to the Earth and kill everyone. Seems like a good idea, but yeah, we're gonna not let you do that. Once the Fifth moves a bit, more enemies spawn in. Char is with them, and even Zex is here too, or Miliardo as he goes by these days. Char looks like a completely different person <laughs> without those sunglasses. In the end, I beat all the bad guys, but it didn't matter. The plan to drop the fifth on Earth worked, and we weren't able to stop it. There's an evacuation order for people down there, but, well, they're probably screwed. Apparently, the people in the space colonies felt like they were being left out lately, so that's why they all joined up with Char to destroy the Earth. Gee, thanks, y'all. And apparently, that attack was just the beginning. Char wants to send an even bigger satellite that has nukes on it to hit the Earth. Oh my god, here we go again. Alright y'all, there's only four missions left. We can do this, stay with me. So Char's giving this big speech about how he's calling his forces Neo Zeon. He says his justification for dropping the nuclear satellite on Earth is that if everyone on Earth's dead, then there won't be any more fighting between the humans on Earth. I mean, you know what? Technically, he's got a point there. He also talks about how it's a shame that Haman Khan's army rose to power, and I think this whole thing could have been avoided if he just got over that relationship, but... Whatever. Things are just getting absolutely out of control, as Lady Yoon gives us a nuke to launch at the satellite. I have no clue how that's supposed to help, but uh, sure. In even worse news, Domon finds that the Devil Gundam has taken over the satellite, and well, let's just see how much worse this thing can get. Apparently, since the Devil Gundam's involved, nukes are off the table for whatever reason, so we have to go inside and beat them all ourselves. Just in time for the fight, though, the other half of Marchwind is able to return from the Muse universe. They're like, hey guys, we saved the day. Oh, hey look, it's Quattro. Hey, why is he in that nuclear satellite? So we have to hurry and explain that no, that's not Quattro. He's actually Char, and he's evil, and he's trying to kill all the humans on the Earth, and we just gotta kill him. Naturally, they're all extremely confused. And then we see some new girl named Quest. I think she's like Char's current love interest. She's like, uh, you sure this is a good idea? And he's like, come on, there's literally zero things wrong with this plan. In the battle, it was more the same, fighting like five trillion regular troops who have no chance, and then the main people. There was this giant, uh, thing attached to the satellite. I think it may have been some part of the Devil Gundam. I don't know what it was, but it had a cool looking attack at least. But yeah, the fight itself is easy. With Char defeated, the only thing left is to go inside and take on the Devil Gundam. Three missions to go! Hang in there, we can do this! Now we're inside the big nuclear satellite thing, and we find none other than Kearns. You know, that guy who was with White Thing? Come on, you remember him, right? Basically, there's this big hallway and all the regular enemies have too much HP. It's like over 30,000 each. There was this weird plant-like thing growing out of there. I guess it had something to do with the Devil Gundam. Some creepy guy named Wong was piloting it, but at least he was dressed nicely. I brought everyone in and prepared for an insane fight. I mean, he had 45,000 HP after all. Rich powered up and, uh, oh, <laughs> I guess it died in one hit. But then, of course, there's a phase two. But even then, he was absolutely no match for Selene and the gang. The Devil Gundam was finally gone. It, at least I think. It seems like this comes back a lot. I don't know the G Gundam lore. After the battle, we're all excited to have finally won, but something's wrong. The satellite is still plummeting to Earth. I guess destroying the Devil Gundam didn't do anything useful after all, so now we gotta figure out a way to destroy this thing. Amuro seems to think this whole thing is Char just wanting to have a final fight against him. The satellite thing's just a way to bait him out to want to have a fight. And, and I used to think Quattro was cool too. 
Two more missions! Oh my god, we're almost there! Now that we realize the Devil Gundam thing was a bust, we're going back to that plan of just launching nukes at the satellite, cause sure, why not nuke a nuke with a nuke? Then we'll hit it with that Gondor cannon that we use to warp people to the Muse universe. And if that isn't enough, well, apparently we'll just go inside and blow it up ourselves. Great plan, y'all. Sounds foolproof. Meanwhile, Char is talking with that quest girl, and he's mumbling about how he wants someone named Lara to save him. I think it may have been his old girlfriend or something. Quest is like, please let me help you and replace Lara. I want to be with you forever. Man, this story, it's just, it's all over the place. I have no clue. Char's like, sure, babe, I'll forget all about Lara. You're my ride or die from now on. Essentially, everyone freaks out. This is the final battle. When it gets into the battle view, Captain Bright sends a few waves of nuclear missiles at that satellite. I'm actually not even sure if it's a satellite. It might be a mistranslation, because it looks like a boulder or something. Anyway, somehow they stop every single missile we send at them, and Char says he was expecting us to try something like that. Since nukes didn't work, now we try the Gondor cannon. It's a direct hit, but I guess it didn't really do anything. Well, the only idea we have left is fly in there and kill everyone, then blow it up ourselves. Not sure how we can do better than nukes, but whatever. It's a standard fight for the most part. A few turns into the battle, Lady Oon appears randomly. She's making a news broadcast to everyone on Earth that this needs to be the last fight between humans. After this, everyone on the planet should strive for peace. The battles are all senseless. Hey, I agree with you there. The satellite moves closer to the Earth every turn. The goal is to get the ship with Captain Bright on it to touch it. I did this, then there was this massive dialogue about getting bombs put on his ship, and he's going to go in there and blow it all up. Uh, good luck with that, dude. It turns out it did work. Kind of. A couple turns later, it shows a bunch of explosions happening on it. It gets snapped in half. One half goes flying away, but the other half is still flying straight for the Earth. It was a good effort, though. I may as well blast Char with Selene for good measure. Screw that guy, I spent all my money on him and then he left the crew, I could have put that on other people. With that, the mission was over. After the battle, we learned from Dr. Hazuki that the trajectory of the satellite combined with the friction from the atmosphere should cause it to fizzle out before really affecting the Earth. However, apparently Amuro went on his own to try to stop it anyway. Long story short, Banjo and a bunch of others fly in to tell him like, Hey, we don't, we don't need you, this thing's gonna stop on its own. And they rescue him. Finally, the conflict is over once and for all. Neo Zeon sent a message offering their unconditional surrender. Just when we're about to celebrate, the alarm goes off. But Neo Zeon surrendered. There's no Muse or Bados, no Mycenae, no Hyaki, no Galactic Empire, no Haman Khan. Who could be causing this? It's time. The final mission of the game. I don't know how a game can possibly be this long, but well, this one is. Let's do this. We're all freaking out that things are going wrong just when we thought it was all over, and boy they sure are. We receive a forced call from someone named Val A. She's there with Avi Lu and Jay Lin, those two super bosses we fought earlier. She says it's time to make contact with us because we finally settled all conflicts. We're like, hey, shut up, and she gets kinda mad. She warps us all to this aerial view of the entire galaxy. We finally decide to listen to what she has to say because we're so scared. She says her species is on the brink of extinction, and they're looking for a replacement to take over the will of the galaxy. They didn't even consider humans to be a worthy replacement, but after we defeated both the Muse Sorbatos Empire and the Galactic Empire, they think we might have what it takes. Basically, these three orchestrated the entire thing. They caused the Muse Sorbatos Empire to invade Earth, which caused the Galactic Empire to show up as well. They thought the two would battle it out, and the victor would inherit the galaxy. But since humans won, now we need to be the protectors. We're totally not cool with all this, and we decline their generous offer. So they decide they'll just kill us instead. Apparently they can just regenerate Emperor Zulu and have him take care of things. Well, guess it's time to fight one last time. The three of them all receive a huge buff at the start. I think it's to their power, or maybe spirit. I'm not really sure. But yeah, the fight is against the two super bosses we already fought, Avi Lu and Jay Lin. Then there's a new one, Val A. They're all really far apart, and I figured, you know, I'll just do the old waste their energy strat. To my surprise, one of them moved on the first turn. Oh my god, they never did that before. But at least the other two stayed still. 
I just used all my powerful attacks with everyone to kill Jaylin immediately as she was the one moving. One out of three down. Next, I move toward Valet in the middle, and Amuro barely tanks her attack. To my surprise, she had got a second attack off in a single turn. Man, I thought I was the only one who could do that. And yeah, Amuro died right away. Still, Rich and Celine were enough to burst her down pretty quickly. Now only Avi Lu was remaining, and I figured I had this in the bag. I just didn't have the firepower to finish her off the... and well, I rage quit. Screw this. Turns out, this mission's harder than I thought. I decided to go with a weird strat of moving my mothership into Jaylin's range, since she was the one who moved first. Then I brought my healers next to it like usual to waste her energy. Avi Lu would move in next, and I would burst her down with Rich and Celine. Valet would come in after her, and again, I could just burst her down with my damage multiplier power-ups. Now I'd just waste Jaylin's energy down to zero, and that'd make it easy to get the final kill. It worked perfectly, and Jaylin was dead. Finally, I was free from this nightmare. Aw, oh, come on, you know there's a phase two, it's the final boss. They all three respond again, and they powered up one more time. Oh my god, it's tough to beat these guys just once, let alone a second time? Ah oh man, as long as I had Selene, I should still be fine, right? Ah oh crap, Jaylin immediately hit her with a crit, killing her in one hit. Well, at least Amuro's still pretty strong too, right? Jaylin was down. Avi Lu came in next, and Ag thankfully still had a damage multiplier left. Hero finished off Avi Lu, and now there was only Val A to free me from this robot game. But I had used literally all my spirit energy by this point, so I only had regular attacks left. Plus, Celine was dead. Sure, I could do the energy wasting and healer strat, but Val A can attack twice per turn. Her attacks outdamage my healers over time, so I had to make this quick. I was really scraping the bottom of the barrel here by sending in the Gundam people to self-destruct. Essentially, if you do that, it kills you, but it deals your current health as damage to any enemies next to you. In fitting fashion, Rich got the final hit in to avenge his lover, Selene. Good riddance, my god. We're all just chilling in this galaxy thing, and we're like, uh, so we can't go back home, right? We killed the people who brought us here. But then somehow, Val A is still alive. She says this is perfect, and the Aliki last purpose in life has been to meet humans and to make them aware of the will of the galaxy. She believes we will step up to the occasion someday. Then she sends us back to our solar system. After the battle, we're all basically wondering if we're really back home. I mean, we can see the moon, we see Earth, and yeah, this must be it. The Earth sphere is truly saved now, and there will be peace forever. All of Marchwind should be proud of what they've achieved, and now it's finally time to go home and rest. And then, finally, the game is officially over. Game complete. Whew, so yeah, there you have it. My journey to beating Super Robot Wars 64. Oh my god, this one clocked in at nearly 72 hours of gameplay. I can't believe such a long game exists on this console. I'd literally never heard of this game, or even this series. Man, this one hit me out of nowhere. Who knows if any of these other Japanese exclusive titles will end up being insane like this. I mean, we already played Mahjong for 26 hours. What else is there? More Mahjong? Anyway, all in all, this game, it's kind of fun. Like, sure, it gets repetitive, but I thought it was a really accessible turn-based strategy game. I've seen some games in this genre get incredibly complex, and this one didn't really feel like that. I mean, maybe it does get that way, but I can't read anything, so I probably didn't do half of the features of the game. It would have been a lot cooler if it had an English translation patch, but there's like 10 trillion lines of text, so good luck with that. The story was just all over the place. When I was playing this, I didn't follow what was going on at all. But now that I'm writing this script, it makes a bit more sense, although I still think it's way too convoluted. I think it's because all the different mecha universes they've crammed into the game, like they're just conflicting with each other. I thought the music was awesome. The graphics were definitely an interesting choice for the N64, and I don't know, I enjoyed it a bit. If you think this looks fun, there's plenty of games in the Super Robo series, and they're still being made to this day. Give it a try. I gave it a 7.5 out of 10 for enjoyability and a 5 out of 10 for difficulty. Hey, thanks for watching the video. Have a sneak peek at the next game. 301 games that could be chosen. 3, 
two, one, go. 146. What's that? Oh my god. Uh, alrighty. We are playing Mahjong Master next. So the RNG has decided. But yeah, if you made it all the way to the end, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed the video, consider giving it a like. It helps the channel a lot. And if you like this series, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on the next one.